Audiobook Title Manifest Fantasy, 01-05, by Diardorito Zembi. Chapter 1, First Contact. Groom Lake, Nevada. Area 51. November 3rd, 2024. Howling winds rolled across the sunny desert, generating a bitter chill that betrayed the year-round desert scorch. Uniformed personnel hastened to secure hangar doors, a bulwark against the assault of the sand while shutdowns were initiated across the base to safeguard the sensitive equipment that resided within. Yet amidst the escalating sandstorm, one particular hangar remained a buzzing hive of activity. A man clad in sand-colored combat fatigues grappled with his cap as he walked past the closing doors. Giving up, he grumbled. Ah, screw this before finally tucking the cap safely between his shirt and vest. A tap on his arm directed his attention upward to a familiar grin. Lieutenant Ron Owens, an imposing figure whose physical prowess could have comfortably secured him a spot on any NFL team, had instead opted for the Space Force. Whenever asked about his decision, his answer was unwavering adventure. Come on now, Henry, aren't you excited? He questioned his genuine enthusiasm contrasting with the professional atmosphere of the facility. Captain Henry Doniger looked past his friend, his eyes settling on a distant part of the hangar concealed by a complex array of hallways, labs, and modules. Excited? Excitement has been a no-show for the last 14 gate activations. Fool me once, right? Ron chuckled, clapping his friend on the shoulder. Look alive, Captain. Trust me. It's different this time. Just wait and see. They ventured deeper into the hangar turned facility, weaving through a maze of scientific apparatus and military personnel. Eventually, they reached the heart of it all, the gateway. The structure loomed over the surrounding space, imposing and mysterious. Resting upright upon a concrete platform, the semicircle stretched to at least half the length of the hangar, boasting a diameter large enough to fit a Boeing 747 with ease. Mysterious symbols, dubbed runes by the researchers, wove their intricate patterns around the ring's perimeter. Thick transparent barriers surrounded the gateway alongside cameras, sensors, and layers of defenses. Incredible awe struck Henry as he absorbed the scene. The mere presence of this enigmatic structure ignited a sense of thrilling anticipation within him a taste of the adventure Ron so often spoke of. Ron leaned against the railing, his eyes similarly wide as he took in the sight. Would you look at that? It's like something out of a science fiction show. I've seen it dozens of times, and it still gets me, Henry admitted. He observed men and women in protective suits setting up computers and other gadgets by a large silvery box that echoed the arcane design of the ring. Though... I don't think I've seen this many people around before. Ron's eyes settled on the figures moving about. They're looking a little more excited than we are. Look, he said, pointing at a group of lab-coated personnel huddled behind some consoles near the gate itself. They're already preparing to seal the ring just in case. Can't blame them, Henry mused, his eyes tracing the myriad of safety measures. Last thing we want is an alien plague on Earth. Ron's laugh was genuine, but his eyes remained fixed on the gate. Or bloodthirsty wannabe Romans. Henry turned towards Ron, his eyes peeling off from the alien structure for a moment. Seriously, Romans? There could be parasitic aliens masquerading as deities, lanky gray men, hell, even dragons and shit, and your first thought is the Roman Empire. What kind of adventure you dream about when you signed up for the Space Force? Look, Cap, not my idea, all right? But there was this one anime. He paused for a moment. Japanese cartoon that depicts fantasy romans pouring out of a portal, just to get clapped by modern guns. Just a reference. Well, as long as it doesn't have any of those generic weave harems and 500-year-old teen girls, I guess I won't judge your taste. Ron looked to the side, his slight gesture slipping past Henry's radar. Anyway, the scientists say that the readings are more energetic than before, and even managed to convince General Harding to come by and check it out. Henry's skepticism returned as a half-smile. Really, now? Ron raised his hands. Look, I've had doubts, but I think I've also had more faith. 
Besides, if Dr. Lamar thinks something's gonna happen for real, then it probably will. Yeah, dude, Henry sighed, conceding. I guess you do have a point there. His eyes drifted over toward a tall blonde woman in a white coat, assisting the other researchers. After pointing at a screen, she paused and looked up at the ring, catching Henry staring at her from the railing. Henry gave a wave and a smile, feeling satisfied as she returned the friendly gesture before going back to work. Ron nudged him teasingly. Got your eye on Dr. Lamar, have you? Watch it, he replied, though his grin belied his feigned irritation. She's the top scientist here, aside from Director Lombard herself. Helps to have friends in smart places. The air in the hangar tightened as the transparent barrier sealed the gateway, trapping it in a fortified containment chamber. The last of the technicians cleared the area, leaving only a quiet hum from the computers and a charged atmosphere crackling with the potential of the unknown. Times like this, I wish we knew more about those who built this thing, Ron admitted, his voice dropping to a contemplative tone. What were they like? Why'd they leave? Henry shook his head, his gaze fixed on the now-contained gate and the automated defenses around it. Maybe we'll find out soon. If what they're saying is true, we might be on the brink of something big here. A voice over the intercom interrupted their conversation. All personnel, please report to your stations. Gate activation will commence in T-minus one hour. Ron glanced at Henry, then the platform above. There, overlooking the bustling hangar, loomed a figure obscured by the sharp light framing the control room's glass. The stern posture and hands clasped behind his back were undeniably those of General Alexander Harding. Next to him, a slender figure watched the preparations with an almost giddy expression Dr. Andromeda Lombard, the director of the Manifest Project. Looks like the director's excited too, Ron observed. Henry followed Ron's gaze, then shook his head, a wry smile tugging at his lips. She may be excited, but I'll believe it when I see it. Let's get to our stations. It's almost showtime. General Harding gazed out the control room's window, eyes narrowing at the array of technical equipment and personnel in motion. Dr. Lombard joined him, tablet in hand, displaying a complex graph of energy signatures. General, the gate's energy pattern has shifted. Oscillations at frequencies never before recorded. Look at this waveform it suggests a resonance with an external source. Harding's focus shifted to the screen, his brow furrowing at the indecipherable dance of spikes and troughs. So we've finally established a two-way connection? Lombard's voice quivered with controlled excitement. Yes. MRD-7 is in position with a range of sensors for environmental analysis. We're ready. Harding set his jaw. This is a significant assertion, Director. Top Brass won't be too pleased with another false alarm. She looked him in the eye. I'm positive. We've been over the data repeatedly. This isn't a glitch. The gate is responding to something tangible. He studied her a moment before nodding. All right. We proceed with caution. At the first sign of irregularity, I want the gate shut down. Understood. She responded, her expression resolute. We'll follow procedures to the letter. They looked out over the hangar once more. The preparations were visible in every corner. Technicians double-checking the MRD-7 recon drone's instrumentation, soldiers in place around the secure perimeter, and scientists huddled around monitors. Harding's voice broke the silence. Let's move to the briefing. Everything's ready? She wondered, referring to the defensive procedure. Everything's in place, Harding answered, reaching the briefing room's doors. He pushed them open, stepping into a room filled with key military and civilian personnel. All eyes turned to them, the room's atmosphere tense with anticipation. The men and women present joining in through several video feeds consisted of the nation's elite, barring the president and vice president themselves, Secretary of State Thompson, Secretary of Defense Morgan, other top-ranking officers, leading scientists in theoretical physics and astrophysics, and government liaisons. General Harding took his place at the head of the table, giving everyone a moment to settle. His eyes scanned the room, 
Recognizing a few who'd been in the Manifest Project since day one Ambassador John Perry, the designated representative for First Contact, and Dr. Oliver Freeman, known for his work on interstellar anomalies. As you all know, Harding began, we're at a critical juncture with the Manifest Project. Today, we are potentially stepping into something entirely new. Next to him, Lombard shifted her weight and motioned to a presentation of charts. We've conducted simulations, analyzed every possible scenario, but reality could be quite different. It's a threshold we've never crossed before. A liaison, seated a few chairs down, tapped his pen on his notebook. General, this could very well be humanity's greatest achievement, or its worst disaster. The safety measures must be impenetrable. Agreed, Harding reassured, resting his elbows on the table. The multi-phase safety protocol has been implemented, and the Recon Rover Pathfinder 1 is equipped with the latest sensor technology, including biohazard detection. Lombard picked up a remote and cycled through a few more visual aids. Not just biohazards. We've prepared for atmospheric, radiological, and other environmental risks. Secretary of State Thompson leaned forward, his screen filling up with his face. How are the first contact preparations coming along? Ambassador Perry responded. Linguistic and cultural experts are all ready. We have several communication strategies depending on the situation at hand. All right then, Thompson finally said. Let us now proceed to discuss first contact protocols and possible outcomes. As the meeting's participants readied their documents, shuffling papers and scrolling through their tablets, Thompson continued. It's been a while since we went through this, so let's go over it again. Director, perhaps you can start with an outline of the communication plan? Lombard scrolled to the relevant section of her presentation, showcasing a flowchart. Certainly. Pathfinder 1 will initially gather data on the other side. If intelligent life is detected, the recon rover has equipment to capture audio and visual cues. We'll start with a nonverbal approach, observing and analyzing any signals, patterns, or behaviors. Perry picked up. If we establish that there is a complex communication system, we'll initiate slow and controlled attempts at interaction. Symbols, sounds, and basic mathematical concepts. What if things turn hostile? The liaison asked. He interlocked his fingers and leaned in. Harding answered the question plainly. We are prepared for that scenario, though it's a last resort. Any trouble, we'll shut the experiment down right away. If push somehow comes to shove, they'll have to get through vacuum, hardened barriers, automated defenses, and a company's worth of firepower all aimed at the gate. The liaison pressed further. And all personnel are briefed on the necessary protocols? Thoroughly. Harding confirmed. Every member of this project knows their role and the steps to be taken at each phase. Morgan nodded, addressing the room. Then we have our plan. Ambassador Perry, General Harding, Director Lombard, on behalf of President Keener, we trust you to lead this delicate task with wisdom and restraint. You hold the keys not only to changing the fate of this country but also of humanity. Now go and make history. Good luck and God bless. Henry shifted his weight, the tactile fabric of his environmental suit adjusting with him. He glanced at the M7 rifle in his hands. Its weight seemed to have subtly increased, as if burdened by the gravity of the mission. His earlier skepticism, once as pervasive as background radiation, had largely decayed. A sudden chime echoed above, followed by an automated announcement. Gate activation in two minutes. So this is it. Henry began, voice taut but tinged with a wisp of irreverence. Two minutes until we either make history or become a cautionary tale. Ron chuckled softly. Yeah, no pressure, right? Just another day at the office. Henry smirked. You ever think we'd be here doing this? About to activate a portal to... Lord knows where? I always thought we'd be doing halo jumps or fighting commies on the moon. If you told high school me about this, I'd say you've got your chevrons locked in all the wrong places. Henry nodded, gaze drifting back to the increasingly busy control room. You know, part of me still wonders if this is just an elaborate, 
overfunded LARP session. If it is, they've got killer production values. For real. Well, Henry sighed, checking the chamber of his M71 last time. Let's just hope the only thing we meet on the other side is an alien deer or something. I can deal with that. Agreed, Ron replied. Anything's better than running into kaijus or eldritch horrors. Henry's eyes flicked back to Ron. You ready? As I'll ever be. Another chime broke through. Gate activation in ten, nine, eight, seven. The gate began to hum, the pitch rising steadily, synchronizing almost organically with the countdown. Concentric rings of light on the gate's frame began to illuminate one by one, forming a radiant cascade toward the center. Each glowing ring separated itself from the main structure, beginning to rotate in the air. Their harmonious interplay spun threads of light that zigzagged across the rings. Geometric shapes materialized pentagons, hexagons, intricate spirals as if etched by unseen hands. They moved with a curious blend of mechanical precision and organic fluidity, aligning in a sequence that seemed to straddle the realms of both precise mathematics and arcane symbols. 6 5 4 The hum escalated into a whirring resonance as the luminous rings accelerated. The inscriptions and runes transformed into flowing streams of light the patterns locking into place as if turning the tumblers of a cosmic lock. The atmosphere itself seemed to become a denser medium, charged by an unknown energy. Three, two, one. Finally, the gate's rotating rings seemed to reach a point of equilibrium. A burst of light erupted, so radiant that Henry and Ron reflexively squinted despite the protective visors of the helmets. The clusters of brightness pulsed, sending a wave of shimmering energy toward the center of the gate. As it collided with the intricate shapes forming within the rings, a chain reaction was triggered each arcane sigil augmented by the incoming energy, amplifying their collective potency and setting the stage for the unfolding vortex. The portal shimmered into existence, its surface an ever-changing tapestry of iridescent hues cerulean, emerald, amethyst yet all bathed in an encompassing celestial silver glow. At irregular intervals, fractal patterns flickered on its surface, reminiscent of the arcane circles, only to dissolve back into the pool of light. It was, in all senses of the word, mesmerizing. Connection is stable, no irregularities detected, Lombard announced over comms. Stand by for rover deployment, Harding's voice echoed next, his tone tinged with an undercurrent of anticipation a rare but justifiable divergence from his usual character. Henry and Ron watched a monitor on their console that showed a live feed from the rover's cameras. Ahead, the rover lurched forward, slowly rolling into the portal. And destiny makes history, Ron muttered. For a split second, the camera feed fuzzed, a kaleidoscope of swirling colors and fluid geometries colliding with one another. It was as if the rover had plunged into a whirlpool made of liquid light and fragmented space a sensation that defied the laws of physics Henry knew. Then, abruptly as it started, the chaos ceased and the view stabilized. The rover emerged into a landscape so picturesque it looked stolen from a painting. Rolling meadows dressed in vibrant hues of green stretched out as far as its cameras could capture, punctuated by bursts of wildflowers that bobbed gently in the wind. Distant mountains stood in the background, majestic and imposing all the same. The sky above held a clarity rarely seen on earth, a near-perfect azure with wisps of cotton-like clouds meandering lazily. Juxtaposed against the lush plains were ruins not of stone and mortar. Instead, they looked wrought from a metallic substance Henry couldn't identify, their surfaces adorned with intricate geometric patterns and clean lines that shimmered as if enchanted. Curves and angles harmonized in their architecture, reflecting the design of the gate. Ethereal light trails connected fragmented platforms, some of which hovered unnaturally above the ground, as if the laws of gravity were suggestions rather than rules. As the rover ventured further, its optics refocused to capture anomalous movement ahead. Emerging from the trillion adjacent to the ruins, figures appeared. They were clearly prepared, their formation suggesting they'd been awaiting something perhaps the gateway's activation. Knights stood at the ready their armor similar to the gray of steel, but more vibrant. 
Their shields bore glowing intricate designs, resonating with a hidden energy. Alongside them stood individuals in robes, wielding staffs crowned with orbs or gemstones emitting a faint aura, mages. The mages murmured incantations or manipulated incantations or manipulated their artifacts, as if in tune with an energy field that the rover's sensors couldn't quantify. Clearly, they had their own procedures and protocols. The silence and anticipation in the hangar gave way to a torrent of hushed murmurs, ranging from excitement about the fantastical humans before them to disappointment from those expecting something more unique. At the forefront of this assembly was a singular figure. His blue robe was a tapestry of symbols and patterns, intricately woven in silver threads that captured and refracted light. At this side, a staff featured a central gem similar to, but grander than those of his companions. Even through the mechanical detachment of the rover's lens, it was palpable this was a man of immense influence and uncanny ability. Leadership identified, Henry stated. Go to FPCO and Charlie. Harding's voice interjected, the weight of his words cutting through the awe-inspiring visuals. Keep your weapons at condition three. Unknown entities ahead. We cannot assume intent. Mr. Ambassador, stand by for first contact. All units, be prepared for contingencies. Henry's fingers danced across his console, toggling the rover's defense systems to a higher readiness level. A sidebar on the screen blinked from green to amber, aligning with the FBCO and change. He glanced at Ron, who had already fine-tuned the focus of the secondary cameras, prepping them for rapid movement and target acquisition. Ambassador Perry, your console is activated, Lombard announced, her voice surprisingly steady. Perry's hands hovered momentarily above the interface, as if savoring the weight of the moment. He engaged the console and scooted his seat inward, taking a deep breath. Across the room, the techs exchanged glances. They had just elevated from routine operation to an uncharted domain. Some seemed on the verge of celebratory cheers, while others remained cautious of their first glance at interstellar life. All eyes returned to the live feed plastered across various screens throughout the hangar. Proceed. Harding finally intoned. The drone's wheels crunched over the foreign yet familiar soil, inching closer to the gathering of knights and wizards. Expressions of bewilderment flickered across their features, morphing gradually into ones of intense curiosity, reverence, or fear. At the head of the group, the archmage's eyes narrowed. His staff came up, not in a threatening manner but more like a conductor gauging the rhythm of an orchestra. He said something, perhaps a soft incantation, and the gem at the apex of his staff glowed momentarily. It was as though he were probing the drone, perhaps seeking to understand its nature or origin. Optical and thermal sensors are still nominal, a nearby tech reported. No signs of jamming or interference. Henry prepared to engage at the slightest hint of hostility but nothing of the sort came. Instead, the knights and wizards seemed to defer to their leader who, after a lingering gaze, lowered his staff and took a deliberate step back. It looks like they're giving us room, Henry noted, feeling the room exhale a collective sigh of withheld breath. Perry moistened his lips, his finger hovering over the console. Initiating first contact sequence. With a press, the rover's external projection system whirred to life. A low hum filled the air as it projected a simple square onto the grassy ground that lay between the rover and the locals. The archmage looked at the shape, then back at his assembly, an unspoken dialogue passing through glances and subtle gestures. He flourished his staff with a fluid movement, its gem glowing once more. A similar square took form, conjured out of thin air, hovering above the projection on the ground. It fit over the original square with such precision that it was as if a blueprint had been laid atop an architect's model. Incredible, Lombard whispered, eyes widening. No hostile body language detected. Harding's voice cut in, a hint of relief coloring his usually stony tone. Continue with the protocol. The atmosphere in the control room shifted perceptibly, like a taut wire suddenly given slack. What they'd seen wasn't merely a return gesture, it was a mirror, a recognition that spanned worlds and just made history. Ambassador Perry began the next sequence, a hopeful, 
almost boyish smile touching his lips. The projection switched from shapes to simple dots of light. One dot appeared first, followed by two dots, then three. The archmage seemed to deliberate for a moment, his eyes moving between his staff and the projection. With another elegant motion, the gem at his staff's pinnacle flared to life. Blue dots materialized in the air, counting upward from one to ten. A collective breath filled the control room. After letting the dots linger for a moment, Perry moved on to the next sequence. He pressed another key, and the projection shifted into a sequence of dots and symbols to signify basic addition. Two dots appeared then across, followed by two more dots. A line of parallel dashes came next, and finally, four dots filled the space. The archmage watched intently before waving his staff once more. His own dots and symbols came to life, perfectly replicating Perry's sequence. 3 plus 4 equals 7. Basic addition, Lombard said, the giddiness in her voice swelling. We've just communicated basic arithmetic across worlds. All right, Harding beckoned. Let's take it up a notch. With another keystroke, the projection transformed. A triangle materialized, its sides demarcated by dots, three on one side, four on another, and the hypotenuse conspicuously empty. For the first time since the interaction began, the archmage hesitated. His eyes squinted, narrowing as if caught in a riddle. The gem on his staff dimmed for a brief moment then flared back to life as though echoing its master's fluctuating certainty. The moment stretched, every second a mallet strike on the drum of tension in the control room. Then, with a motion almost casual, he waved his staff. Five dots appeared along the previously empty hypotenuse. Holy shit! Henry muttered, incredulous. Ron nodded, equally stunned. He understands the Pythagorean theorem. The archmage then did something unexpected. With a few more waves of his staff, he conjured up a series of dots and symbols, using a circle to represent multiplication. 3 times 3 plus 4 times 4 is equal to 5 times 5. He then drew a new triangle, its individual sides containing 5, 12, and 13 dots followed by the respective formula. He knows! Lombard exclaimed, nearly jumping out of her seat. He's not just repeating what we're showing. He's expanding on it. The personnel in the room shared varying levels of surprise at the groundbreaking interaction they had just witnessed, reflected in a chorus of gasps, wows, and excited chatter. Harding's neutral tone seemed to gain an edge of wonder. Record the data for immediate analysis and keep the interaction going. What's the next step in the protocol? Mathematics seems a universal language. Perry observed, already initiating the next phase. We'll transition to basic physics and chemistry before tackling linguistics. The projection changed again, a simple lever appearing with a fulcrum, effort, and load represented by varying numbers of dots, a straightforward concept, but a building block to more complex ideas. The archmage waved his staff, nascent blue particles swirling in the air and coalescing into an image. But before the conjuration could solidify, the rover's external microphone spiked with a distant shout. The archmage's eyes shot to the side out of the camera's field of view and the fledgling image collapsed, its particles disappearing into the ether. Abruptly, a knight blurred into the rover's camera frame. His pace was too fast, supernaturally so, as if the armor were woven from air rather than metal. The knight decelerated with such abruptness that dust plumes rose at his feet. He skidded to a halt beside the archmage, planting his boots firmly and pulling him to the side. The archmage resisted momentarily, spitting out rapid-fire syllables in their native tongue unintelligible to parry. But when a muffled explosion boomed in the distance, the archmage ceased his protests and abandoned his progress with the rover. Relenting, he followed the knight, sprinting toward the growing clamor. Rovers picking up additional contacts, numbering in the low hundreds coming in fast from the east, about a click out. Possible hostels closing on the contact site, Henry reported. Harding leaned into the microphone, his voice echoing through the intercom. All units, prepare for contingency plan Delta-2. Ambassador, halt the protocol. 
Director, Status on Environmental Safety? Rover data shows atmosphere is 74% nitrogen, 25% oxygen, 1% other trace gases. Gravity is 1G Earth normal. All filters for biological, chemical, and radiological hazards are green. Lombard rattled off, eyes scanning the multiple data streams on her screen. Confirmed. No immediate environmental threats. Harding noted. Ambassador Perry, prep to resume first contact once the area is secured. Your Enviro suit is on standby. Understood, General. Perry acknowledged, watching the situation unfold on the other side through the rover's feeds. Henry and Ron executed a swift status check alongside a platoon of personnel under their command. All systems green, suits at 100%, weapons at condition 1. Henry confirmed. Copy that. Ron ensured his rifle was completely prepared for combat, and fingers ready to flick the safety off. After a chorus of confirmations from their platoon, Harding issued the final command. You are cleared to proceed. Remember, ROE applies here, minimal force to neutralize threats. Exercise caution the locals may not recognize your weapons. We're not just representing America, we're representing Earth. Prepare for barrier disengagement, he announced. A technician carried out Harding's command. A series of mechanical clunks and groans resonated throughout the room as heavy blast doors and other security measures started to retract, one by one. Deploy UGVs to lead the entry, Harding ordered. Operators immediately engaged their control systems. Heavily armed unmanned ground vehicles rolled through the portal. Screen feeds lit up across the room, showing first glimpses of an alien terrain. Henry and Ron followed suit, approaching the swirling gateway. Godspeed, Harding said, a note of hope coloring his voice. With that, Henry led his team into the gateway. One moment he was outlined in the vortex of light, the next gone. Ron and the others followed, swallowed by the unknown. Henry felt as if he had been hurled through a wall of ice-cold water, every sense momentarily numbed. Just as quickly, he found himself grounded, boots hitting a stone platform leading up to the hilltop gateway. The portal's glow faded behind them, its radiance swallowed by a different sort of luminescence a serene, natural daylight. Security Platoon Zula 9 sound off. Henry called out as he secured the perimeter. Ron rested his hands on his knees. A bit queasy, but all good. Two, good to go, another member said. Three, all clear. The roll call continued crisply as the members took in the scenery. Seeing it in person was a different beast compared to seeing it on the screens back at the base. On the ground, the blue skies seemed brighter, the landscape more idyllic. Juxtaposing this view was a set of sleek ruins, and something far less idyllic. Distance to the combat zone? Henry questioned, the words sounding inadequate even as he said it. About 400 meters, sir, one of the men answered. Henry zoomed in using his visor, the range finder confirming the distance. He squinted, trying to make out the individual elements of the conflict below. He saw the knights and wizards from before, facing off against some sort of creature. Some of them were agile and small scurrying on four legs covered in greenish scales. Others were larger and muscular, taking to the sky for brief seconds with leathery wings. And then there were the big ones, towering and dragon-like, circling above the mayhem, occasionally swooping down like birds of prey and laying bursts of fire. What the fuck? Henry heard one of his men mutter over comms, disbelief leaking through the helmet. Everyone had their fair share of comments likening the scene to everything fantasy, from Dungeons and Dragons to a smattering of MMORPGs and anime. As Henry and his platoon assessed the situation, the battlefield lit up with mystical flames and roared with earth-shattering cries. Knights clad in intricately designed plate armor stood their ground, almost glowing as they clashed with the scaled creatures. Around them, individuals dressed in robes conjured an array of elemental spells, offering both offense and defense in coordinated maneuvers. What in the world is happening down there? Someone carrying a grenade launcher muttered. Looks like a renaissance fair gone horribly wrong. 
Yeah, except Renaissance fairs don't usually include artillery. Ron added, noticing bursts of fire arcing through the air and crashing into clusters of the smaller, greenish creatures. The explosions were followed by a chorus of what they could only describe as otherworldly shrieks. The knights were remarkable in their own right. They moved with agility on par with that of an Olympic sprinter despite their heavy armor, delivering blows that seemed unnaturally powerful, cleaving through the tough scales of the larger creatures. Some performed leaps that carried them several meters across the battlefield, landing amid a throng of enemies only to reposition swiftly and strike. Now this is what I'd expect a Warcraft movie to look like, whispered one of the younger members of Zulu 9. Fucking crazy. The magical support was even more bewildering. From his vantage point, Henry noticed spikes of earth suddenly emerging from the ground, impaling smaller creatures. Patches of the land seemed to freeze instantaneously, causing creatures to stumble and slow. Brilliant shields of translucent energy materialized around clusters of knights, deflecting the fiery breath of the larger dragon-like entities. Several mages at a distance from the main battle raised their staffs skyward. A series of brilliant flares burst into the sky, exploding into showers of sparkling light. The larger, winged creatures recoiled, some tumbling from the sky in disoriented spirals. Suddenly, the air seemed to ripple with energy. Henry watched as a handful of mages and knights converged, their hands and weapons glowing as if sharing energy. What happened next was straight out of a legend. A vortex of fire and air, a swirling tornado of flames, erupted from the gathered group, surging forward to consume dozens of the scaled creatures in its path. Despite the grand displays of magical and martial prowess, the monstrous hordes seemed largely unaffected. It was clear that the knights and wizards were faltering, the beasts winning this battle of attrition. Henry broke their trance. All right, Zulu 9, we're looking at real people, yeah, okay, and real monsters down there. The entities down there resemble knights and wizards, but under Complan Delta 2, they qualify as diplomatic personnel. Our mandate is to protect them and offer tactical assistance to stabilize the situation. They may react with hostility, sir. How are we supposed to communicate? Someone asked. We've got our own universal language, firepower and backup. Henry's confident reply came. We're going to get down there, assist them, and hope to God they're smart enough to realize we're friendlies. No offensive actions against anything human-shaped or resembling those knights and wizards unless they fire first. Copy delineating friend from foe based on visual parameters, another man said, relaying the information back to the drone operators. And let's get the rover active, Henry added. They didn't attack it before. Maybe seeing it fighting alongside us will hammer home the point that we're allies. The rover joined them in response, small turrets on its chassis prepared to fire. The UGVs took flanking positions, their weapons systems armed but holding fire. The rover lumbered ahead of them, its armaments trained on advancing beasts that broke away from the main horde. Meanwhile, the men on the ground moved like clockwork, squads fanning out in a loose line perpendicular to the threat ahead. FCO, enemy contact, 400 meters, multiple ground and airborne targets. Coming in from the tree lean. The fire control order jolted through Zulu 9's comms. Henry didn't hesitate. Weapons free! Gunfire erupted from the line in a cacophony of controlled chaos. As Henry pulled the trigger, the rifle recoiled in his arms, each 6.8 millimeters round whizzing through the air and finding its mark among the charging, scaled creatures. The effects of the projectiles were immediate and destructive, the hides and scales not meant to withstand anything stronger than arrows. Two of the smaller creatures skidded and toppled over, legs jerking in post-mortem spasms. Reloading! Henry's shout was almost drowned out by the continuous rattle of machine guns and the deeper booms of the UGV's auto cannons. He ejected the spent magazine and slammed a fresh one in, the metallic clink echoing in the air as he chambered the first round. The UGVs contributed more than their fair share to the cacophony. Their 30mm auto cannons roared, each explosive round impacting the field with ferocity turning earth and creature alike into a mist of blood and soil. 
Alongside this mechanized onslaught, the platoon's machine gunners set their M250S to work, sending a torrent of lead into the mass of attackers. The machine guns fire nonstop, their barrels growing hot as they sent a relentless stream of bullets at the mass of enemies. Snipers, focus on the larger ones. Those things look like pack leaders, Henry ordered, watching as one resisted the impact of several rounds. Roger that, sir. Adjusting targets, came the calm reply from one of the snipers. A moment later, a high-caliber round cracked through the air. One of the larger, lion-sized creatures let out an ear-piercing shriek as part of its body was torn off. Henry's gaze then shifted back to the Archmage's forces. The knights and mage, initially startled by the onslaught of unfamiliar weaponry, now regained their composure. They knew that aid however peculiar was here. A staff rose into the air, its tip growing brightly before releasing a beacon of light into the sky of flare, Henry inferred. A cry for reinforcement, or perhaps, acknowledgement. Davis, he turned to one of his men. Send up a counter flare. Let them know we see them, and we're with them. The American flare ascended, meeting the arcane light of the Archmage spell and breaking through the language barrier. With the understanding of support realized by the locals, Henry returned to the battle at hand. He glanced at his HUD as new icons appeared, highlighting airborne targets that veered from the Archmage's position. It was none other than the dragon-like monstrosities that dwarfed their terrestrial kin, flocking toward their greatest threat. Aim for the eyes or wing joints, Ron transmitted, falling back on fragmented lore from fantasy media back home. Copy, targeting vulnerabilities, a sniper responded. Adjusting to the aerial threat, Henry issued a new command. UGVs switched to anti-air. Light those dragons up. The autocannons on the UGVs whirred as they tilted upwards, redirecting fire from the beasts below to the threats above. They rattled off volleys of 30 mm rounds and sent waves of Sacklow's missiles from their customized pods filling the sky with the discordant symphony of whirring machinery and explosive munitions. The dragon-like entities roared in a mixture of fury and pain, veering erratically but vainly. As the 30 mm rounds made contact, the effects were devastating. The dragons or whatever they were wailed in fury and agony, their roars piercing even the clamor of machinery and explosions. Those cries became increasingly erratic as they were buffeted by the incoming ordnance. Any magical barriers or scales that once shielded them rapidly disintegrated under the barrage. Raw, unprotected flesh was laid bare, torn open by each new round and missile. One beast found its wing torn off by a direct missile hit, the resulting imbalance sending it tumbling out of the sky like a faltering kite. Another took a missile straight to its midsection, resulting in a gut-wrenching fireball that showered its kin below with viscera. The overkill was evident. These were weapons designed for armored vehicles and aircraft, not creatures of myth and scale. Henry watched as the tide finally turned. The smaller creatures, many no larger than wolves but deadlier in their own rights, halted their advance. What had been a wave of malevolence now fractured into a scattered, disorderly retreat. Like water pulled by an unseen force, they ebbed away, retreating into the dark embrace of the surrounding forests. Cease fire. Henry finally ordered, his voice edged with caution. Zula 9, prepare for the next phase. A subtle release of tension flowed through Henry's muscles. The first critical phase was over. They had successfully completed the directives of Contingency Plan Delta 2 and protected the Archmage's men. His gaze shifted to the Archmage and his cadre, who were staring back with a range of emotions, awe, relief, confusion, and suspicion. Among them, the Archmage stepped forward, as if ready to begin talks. It was one thing to repel an enemy attack. It was another to navigate this uncharted social terrain. With a hand signal, Henry motioned for his men to regroup before climbing onto the rover. With a smooth hum, they descended the hill toward the waiting Archmage. As the rover came to a gentle stop, Henry disembarked. He walked up to the Archmage, the servos and his envirosuit whirring faintly. The fine details seemed to grow louder. He was acutely aware of the weight of his own gear, the rifle slung across his chest, 
and the numerous eyes both familiar and foreign watching him. A blend of excitement, trepidation, and pride swelled within him. Here he was, at the threshold of Earth's first interstellar contact. The archmage shared a glance with his knights and mages, giving a subtle nod. The staffs dimmed as their arcane energy disappeared into the air, and the knights returned their swords to their scabbards with a synchronized metallic slide. The archmage then extended his staff toward the earth, tracing two identical rune-laden circles on the ground. He stepped into one of them and made a gesture toward the vacant one, eyes locking onto Henry. His earpiece vibrated. Captain, what's your status? Harding asked. We saw the locals lower their weapons. Sir, first contact remains non-hostile so far, Henry reported, keeping his eyes on the archmage. He's created some kind of red magic circle. Looks like an invitation or a test. Could be their method of communication or some ritual for trust. Harding hesitated for a brief moment. Standard protocol recommends we wait for Dr. Anderson and the linguistic team to take the lead, but... Director Lombard interjected. This could be an unprecedented opportunity for diplomatic relations, general a groundbreaking moment for humanity. Their peaceful reaction to our rover especially after it aided them in battle indicates that we might be missing an invaluable diplomatic opportunity if we hesitate now. General Harding sighed audibly. We should err on the side of caution, but you're right. The fact they accepted our aid and lowered their weapons does speak to potential friendliness. Ambassador Perry, who had been silently listening, finally spoke. What's the risk-benefit here, General? It wouldn't make sense for the locals to backstab us after all that's happened. Moreover, with Captain Doniger having actively participated in combat, he has most likely gained a level of standing among them. Cultural norms could make it critical for him to make the first move. Wouldn't you normally be the one to initiate first contact? Harding asked, directing the question to the ambassador. In any other circumstance, yes, Perry responded. But Henry has the situational awareness here. And I don't want to risk ruining this by stepping in and possibly creating a cultural faux pas, like appearing to withdraw our champion at a crucial moment. Captain Doniger has discretionary authority as far as I'm concerned. I agree with the ambassador, Lombard said. Harding relented. Very well. Captain, you've been given discretionary authority. It's your call. Henry looked at the archmage's earnest face and the red magical circle beneath him. Then he glanced back at his men, silhouetted against the iridescent light show behind them. The call was his, and now the weight of the world fell upon his shoulders. One small step, Ron murmured, voicing the opening phrase of a quote that had once bridged another frontier. Henry grinned, feeling the weight and wonder of the moment. One giant leap, he replied, stepping into the circle. Chapter 2, Gera Vicinity of the Gateway, Unknown Planet November 3rd, 2024 As Henry stepped into the circle, electricity seemed to dance along his skin. The sensation faded as red hues dimmed, the circles disappearing into the air. He locked eyes with the robed figure, whose previously taut gaze softened. The man's smile seemed to border more on excited curiosity rather than just plain friendliness. Ah, uh, your timely arrival, and the strength you and your companions displayed against those malevolent beasts these are blessings for which I must express gratitude. The archmage began. His voice carried a slightly lilting tone, words far too articulate, and surprisingly, in English. Henry's eyebrows twitched slightly in surprise. He was familiar with the concept of universal translators from various shows. Evidently, the world beyond the gate was no stranger to it. This magic you've cast, it allows us to understand each other's speech. The archman's eyes shimmered with mirth. Indeed, you have activated the circle of understanding. Do you find this agreeable? Henry relaxed. It's surprising but very useful. Before we proceed, did any of your men sustain injuries during the attack? We have medics on standby who can assist. The archmage glanced back. Thankfully, the majority are unharmed and the rest are already under the care of our healers, but your offer is appreciated. 
And so, may I know who has graced us with such timely intervention? Henry considered shaking the archmage's hand, before settling on a quick salute. I'm Captain Henry Doniger from the United States of America, planet Earth. We come in peace. He cringed as the cliched words rolled off his tongue, but he had to admit, it did sound fitting. A captain a rank of weight and responsibility, no doubt. I am Kelmuthus Adhelis of the Sinaran Federation, of the realm of Gera. I am an archmage and scholar amidst these ancient ruins, and perhaps, today, a herald to a new epoch. He extended his hand, palm open and fingers slightly curled the universal invitation across cultures, Henry figured. He mirrored the gesture with his gloved hand, finding Kelmuthus' grip firm, yet not imposing. A herald to a new epoch, you say? Henry raised an eyebrow. So then, you're authorized to kickstart diplomatic ties between our worlds? Kelmuthus gave a hearty laugh as he released Henry's hand, his fingers briefly brushing a pendant at his chest. The very act of our meeting, Captain, serves as an initiation of sorts. I can mediate, but let us proceed cautiously. The landscape is uncharted for both of us. Henry's eyes tracked the brief touch to the pendant before he refocused on the archmage. The hint of levity in his eyes gave way to a more serious look. Safety should be our top priority. Kelmuthus flexed his hand on his staff. Indeed, Captain. The path ahead is veiled, yet the mere thought is exhilarating. And on the note of safety, your armor it is quite unlike anything I've seen. It's more than just armor, sir. Henry paused, searching for the right words. This suit I'm wearing, it's not just protection against weapons or the environment. It's also to prevent the spread of diseases that our worlds might not be prepared for. Kelmuthus lifted his chin as he scanned the contours of the suit. Ah, a warding garment then, shielding against spirits of pestilence, or something akin to an enchanted piece to protect against threats such as flames? Fascinating and wise. It would seem our worlds, though different, share common threats. Henry tilted his head. He was sure Perry would have handled this better, but he more or less got the point across. Yes, sir, something like that. And until we have a clearer understanding of our respective environments, it's best to exercise caution. I concur, Captain. As you've put eloquently, safety should be our top priority. As interested as I am in embracing and exploring the unknown, your caution is warranted and wise. On that note, what comes next in your procedures? Are there rites or ceremonies to solidify our newfound understanding? Henry felt the weight of the archmage's words, a strange blend of poeticism and practicality lyrical, archaic, but easy to understand. Still, it was jarring to him, reminding him of his historic position. We have a designated diplomat for things like that, someone who can navigate the intricacies of first contact. Would it be acceptable for me to introduce him? Kalmuth's gaze deepened, assessing. An ambassador, skilled in the art of words and negotiation? Indeed, I believe that would be prudent. However, I must ask, where is this diplomat of yours? He's on the other side of the portal, in our world. He and our leaders are observing and listening to our conversation, ensuring we move forward with the best intentions, Henry explained gesturing toward the devices within his helmet. The archmage's eyebrows rose in mild surprise. An impressive feat of artifice, scrying through contraptions, he murmured. So even though we stand in a different realm, they listen and advise from the shadows? Henry gave a slight chuckle. Not exactly from the shadows. Think of it like scrying, to see what's ahead of you in a dark dungeon. Kelmuthus nodded. Very well. Let us hear from this ambassador. Henry breathed an internal sigh of relief. He knew little about the jargon of fantasy that was Ron's forte. Yet, it seemed the archmage standing in front of him understood his message. Mr. Ambassador, I believe it would be best if you made a personal appearance on this side. A pause ensued before Perry's voice responded. Understood, Captain. Give me a few moments to make preparations and I'll cross over. Maintain your diplomatic etiquette. Take the time you need, Henry replied, looking back at Kelmuthus. The ambassador will be joining us in person shortly. 
I hope this format will be more conducive to our discussions. Kalmathus glanced toward the portal with a sense of wonder and anticipation. It is a remarkable age we live in, where worlds once separated can now meet with but a few steps. I shall eagerly await his arrival. Until then, Captain Doniger, perhaps we can share more of our own experiences and tales? Henry gave a nod, smiling out of relief now that the hard part was over. The opportunity for a more casual interaction was more than welcome. Certainly. There's much I'd like to learn about Gera, and I'm sure you have questions about Earth as well. Kalmathus gazed towards the battlefield, his eyes briefly tracing the remnants of the struggle. Indeed, I must thank you again for your aid against the Fenworms. It's not often one sees such efficiency in dispatching them, especially the Tier Six Fenworm Lords. Henry followed his gaze, grimacing. So that's what they're called. The Fenworms. They attacked without provocation. We have creatures back on Earth that can be hostile, but these, they're on a different scale. Do they frequently pose a threat? Kelmuthus sighed, a note of weariness in his voice. Indeed. These creatures have been the bane of many travelers and settlements. Especially the warriors and alphas. The spawns, while numerous, are easier to manage. Do they normally appear in packs like this? Not normally. It is likely they were drawn by the intense arcane energies produced by the gateway as it formed the portal. He leaned in, as if scrutinizing Henry. Yet, despite the overflowing energies of the ether, I sense none from you or your kin. Is this absence common among your people? Henry shrugged. Is that what you call the stuff you use to make fireballs? As far as I know, we only have stories about magic. What you see is the result of technology and innovation, without the touch of the ether dot. The Archmage leaned back a bit he looked genuinely surprised. A realm without magic? How wondrous and strange that must be. And yet you've achieved so much. In the absence of the ether, what fuels these machinations? Henry hesitated, searching for a simple explanation. Energy. Derived from various resources on our planet. It's a transformation of potential to motion. Kelmethus nodded slowly. Much like the conversion of raw magical energy into a tangible spell. Or perhaps, if my understanding aligns with yours, it parallels the new steam engines crafted by one of the industrious dwarven nations. Yet another basic trope that even he despite his lack of interest in fantasy could understand. Yeah, those steam engines would probably be an apt comparison. Henry's answer only fueled the Archmage's thirst for understanding. His gaze sharpened, becoming more analytical. In the skirmish against the Fenworms, your prowess was evident. With what means do you channel such destructive force? We have a combination of weaponry, guns for infantry, supported by... Henry paused, wondering how to put it. Mechanical carriages with larger guns on them. Kelmuthus leaned in his demeanor becoming more like an ecstatic researcher than that of a distinguished archmage. These guns you speak of, do they launch metal bolts? Much like a more advanced arquebus? Henry pondered for a moment, drawing from his limited knowledge of the topic. Yes, similar to an arquebus but more refined. In our history, we had early firearms, a bit unreliable and less precise. As technology progressed, these early firearms evolved into the guns we use today. A path of evolution dictated by necessity and environment. A world of endless curiosities. Your tales would be cherished among our scholars. Henry smiled. Hopefully, there'll be ample opportunity for exchanges in the future. Speaking of which, the envoy I mentioned earlier, Ambassador Perry, should be joining us momentarily. He's better versed in navigating diplomatic waters. As if on cue, a glimmer from the portal caught their attention. Emerging from the shimmering gateway and descending the hill was a figure, distinguished not just in gait and demeanor, but also in attire. While all suits shared the same pristine white base, this new arrival suit bore elegant gold trim and a streamlined appearance, contrasting the muted gray markings and bulky attachments on those of Henry and his team. Both suits displayed the star-spangled banner of their homeland, but the diplomat's suit also showcased an additional emblem a silver dove, 
wings outstretched, positioned above the flag. Kalmathus observed the approaching figure with interest. Ah, the promised anvil. He carries an aura of experience and knowledge. Henry nodded in agreement. Ambassador Perry has been through many negotiations and peace talks on our world. We're hopeful his expertise will aid in forging a strong bond between our societies. Allow me to prepare another circle. Kelmethus tightened his grip around his staff, its ornate gem pulsing with a gentle light. Drawing the staff close to the ground, the archmage began to mutter in a cadence, the words unfamiliar despite the translation magic. With each word, the staff's glow intensified, and the ground before him began to shimmer. The patterns danced and interwove, finally settling into a distinct red circle similar to the one Henry had stepped into. He exhaled slowly, the energy from the staff receding. It is complete. Please have your envoy step into it, as you have done. He declared, raising his gaze to meet Perry's. Captain Doniger, Perry began, his eyes sweeping over the scene. Looks like the initial contact went well. Better than expected, sir he replied. The magic circle you see here is called the Circle of Understanding. Works like a universal translator. Perry moved forward, positioning himself inside the circle. An ethereal glow momentarily enveloped him before settling down. Perry blinked, processing the sensation, then nodded towards Kelmethus. Impressive. It feels intuitive. The archmage extended his hand. Welcome to the realm of Gera. I am Archmage Kelmuthus Adhelis of the Sanaran Federation. Offering a warm, respectful smile, Perry accepted the hand. I'm Ambassador John Perry, representing the United States of America and the greater domain of Earth. It is truly an honor to meet the individual who made this remarkable first contact possible. Kelmuthus quirked an eyebrow. Were you the seer behind the earlier visions? The shapes and arithmetic? Perry gave a slight nod, gesturing towards the rover. Indeed. Through that device, I relayed our symbols and numbers, a way to establish a foundation for our interaction. Kelmuthus' gaze lingered on the rover. It reminded me of controlling a homunculus or viewing through the eyes of a summoned golem. Though your method was devoid of magic and intriguing thought. Perry acknowledged the remark with a nod shifting the conversation toward the immediate concerns. While our meeting today holds promise for both our worlds, our primary concern is the safety and well-being of everyone involved. Earlier, your men faced an attack by those creatures. Is there any immediate medical attention required for your people? The captain was quick to offer aid. Fortunately, our healers have already tended to the wounded. But I sense your approach to vitality is vastly different from ours. Perry agreed. It is. Still, it's heartening to know your people have been taken care of. I believe in the value of exchanging knowledge. Understanding each other's methods of healing can only benefit both our worlds. A collaborative approach could be most beneficial. The Archmage agreed. While our healers employ both natural remedies and magic, it would be fascinating to learn of your techniques. Perry chose his words with care. On Earth, our methods of healing and protection are rooted in understanding the tiny, unseen organisms that make up our body and the environment around us. Some we call pathogens. They are so small they cannot be seen with the naked eye, but they can cause illness. Kalmathus pondered the explanation, his eyes alight with curiosity. An intriguing notion. It resonates with some ancient writings. They speak of a world teeming with life, not all of which can be seen. So, these pathogens, you've found ways to observe them? Yes, he responded. Through devices that magnify, we can observe them. Perhaps akin to our divining magic that reveal hidden curses. And these invisible agents, if from our realm, could pose a threat to yours, or vice versa? Exactly, Perry replied. There's potential for unpredictable reactions when the organisms of two different worlds converge. It's why we tread carefully. A thoughtful expression passed over the archmage's face. I surmise then, it is this knowledge that prompted the protective armor your men don. It shields not just against the seen, but the unseen? 
Perry affirmed with a nod. That's a succinct way to put it, Archmage. Before progressing further, we need to ensure no harmful elements affect either side. This would involve collecting samples from the environment and Garen organisms, including samples of bodily fluids. Kelmethus appeared to frown before returning to a neutral expression. Your vigilance is commendable. We can coordinate with your scholars to ensure this balance. While magic can detect and deter many impurities, melding our methods with your unique approach will make our joint efforts more robust. Perry showed no sign of his internal relief. It's heartening to find understanding and cooperation in such an alien landscape. In addition to our immediate concerns, I believe it might be beneficial to have linguistic and cultural teams from both our worlds convene. The circle of understanding provides a bridge, but deeper understanding will foster even stronger ties. Your words hold great wisdom, Ambassador. There is a city nearby, Eldralor, which would be an apt place for your scholars to immerse and learn, and for diplomacy to be officially discussed. That sounds promising, Perry replied. We'll need time to prepare our delegation. He paused, looking at the time conversion plastered on his HUD. Apparently, Gera had a similar daily rotation to Earth. We can convene here in seven days. Will that provide adequate time for your people to prepare? That should be sufficient, Ambassador. Kelmethus confirmed. During this time, Perry continued, We would like to set up a permanent base of operations near the portal. This will facilitate our communication and aid in the safety and well-being of both our people. Kelmethus tapped his fingers around his staff. The Grendon Plains is considered neutral territory. There are no holdings or treaties preventing you from building here. We will have a few specialists and scholars remain here, both to aid in your protocols and to share knowledge. Once you're ready, we will escort your delegation to Elderlore for the official talks. Perry offered a handshake. Archmage Kelmethus, I feel very optimistic about the future of our two worlds. We have taken the first steps toward a meaningful relationship. The Archmage grasped Perry's hand firmly. Indeed, the potential here is unfathomable. I pray this marks a new epoch of prosperity and knowledge for both our civilizations. Grendon Plains Armstrong Base November 10, 2024 Henry's boots pressed into the soft grass, leaving a faint trail behind him. Patches of terrain had been cleared, and signs of early groundwork for infrastructure were evident, rudimentary paths, communication equipment, construction vehicles, and tents. Over the last week, remains from the battle against the Fenworms were cleared out and prefabricated structures had sprung up around the portal's perimeter, with a semblance of order now overtaking what was once unknown wilderness. The sound of machinery in the distance added a constant backdrop as he approached the prefab command center. By the gateway, a handful of mages prepared translation circles for new arrivals. Stepping inside the metal structure, he was immediately met by the hushed buzz of conversation. The round table in the center was covered in Sonaran maps of the region and various reports. While there weren't any satellite images, Drones had done their part in capturing aerial views of the terrain leading to Eldralore. Nearby, a screen displayed an interactive map generated from the reconnaissance data, giving a bird's eye view of the convoy route. General Harding stood at the head of the table, his sharp gaze analyzing the paths ahead. Perry and Lombard were already seated, chatting with other personnel and shuffling through piles of reports. As Henry took his place, one of Lombard's assistants handed one such report to him. He skimmed it, noting the positive results regarding biological compatibility. Clearing his throat, General Harding began. Thank you all for gathering. We've had a week in Gera, a week of adapting, of coordinating, and of laying down our first footprints on this foreign soil. Reports are promising. No harmful pathogens to speak of, no errant weather patterns to worry over and our personnel have been updating protocols based on local flora and fauna interactions. Henry nodded, recalling the meticulous checks he underwent after every external patrol. It was reassuring to know that Gera's environment was, at the very least, not overly hostile. Ambassador Perry took the cue. On the diplomatic front, 
Our conversations with Archmage Kelmethus and his associates have been fruitful. We've established primary terms of engagement, and the Cenarians have been more than cooperative. General Harding leaned in slightly, placing both hands on the table. We've been fortunate so far. The Cenarians have been invaluable in teaching us about the local wildlife and guiding our recon. But here's the hard truth. While we've chased away most of the hostile fauna and secured a clear path to Elderlore, there are pockets out there that are unpredictable. Henry studied the route highlighted on a screen ahead. A network of blue lines signified rivers, and patches of green hinted at forests. But what caught his attention were the gray symbols caves and ruins. Any significance to these? A voice beside him chimed in. It was Kelmethus, wearing an attire less grand than their first meeting, but no less majestic. He also wore a plate carrier vest under his robes a sight that continued to jar Henry. These are local cave systems and forgotten ruins. They might appear dormant from the surface, but they're historically known to be hideouts for bandits, brigands, and other miscreants, not to mention the presence of beasts that claim them as lairs. Henry's grip tightened on a new report. He'd seen what these bandits could do during their attacks on merchant convoys. We've been using the intel provided by our Cenarin counterparts throughout the week to shape our strategy. With everything we've gathered, are there any last-minute adjustments or recommendations you'd advise? General Harding, after a brief moment of contemplation, replied, our drills and simulations incorporated everything we've received. Today, we finalize and fine-tune these plans based on real-time conditions and any additional Cenarin input. We need to ensure all teams are synchronized and ready for contingencies. As the words left the general's mouth, a junior officer rushed into the tent, holding up a tablet displaying a drone feed. General, we picked up minor activity roughly ten miles ahead on the route to Elderlore he remarked, tapping on the screen to expand the drone feed. It showed an overhead view of a meadow. Faint wisps of smoke rose, suggesting a small campfire. From the aerial perspective, there was no discernible movement in the vicinity of the smoke, no visible figures, nor any indication of it being anything more than a solitary fire. Kelmethus examined the feed. That's close to the footpath used by adventurers from Elderlore seeking ancient relics in the nearby ruins. It's not unusual for them to set up camp. They usually travel in small parties. Hmm. Harding crossed his arms as he considered the new information. We'll make some adjustments. Let's include an extra UGV and have an armed drone provide escort above the convo for increased visibility and rapid response. Kelmethus inclined his head. Considering the complexities we might face ahead, I suggest being present in the MRAP alongside Ambassador Perry and Captain Doniger. I can help facilitate dialogue with my countrymen and my knowledge might provide additional safeguards against magical threats we might encounter. Henry exchanged a glance with Perry, who subtly nodded in agreement. Having an expert in magic sounds like a logical measure, Henry remarked. Very well. Before we finalize the formation, let's introduce you to some key members who will be accompanying this mission. They're specialists, each chosen for their unique expertise, ensuring our convoy's security and the success of this delegation and beyond. The general got up from the table and walked toward the exit. They made their way toward a garage, where a group of vehicles and a line of individuals in varying uniforms awaited them. He gestured towards the first figure in line. Many of you already know Lieutenant Ron Owens. He was among the first to step into this world, guiding our initial exploration. As Owens gave a curt nod, the general's hand moved to the next two figures. Isaac Yen and Ryan Hayes, specialists sent from Langley. If anyone can help us understand the complexities of Garen society, it's them. Both Yen and Hayes gave casual nods, their reactions betraying the cryptic introduction provided by General Harding. Next, Harding continued, his finger pointing to a man who seemed like a middle-aged college professor yet carried himself like a trained soldier. Is Dr. Victor Anderson. His name might ring a bell for those who have been with the Manifest Project for a while. He was instrumental in decoding some of the enigmatic artifacts, building the groundwork for the gate activation. 
He'll be accompanying the delegation to study Sanarin culture up close. Dr. Anderson's face, etched with lines of experience, broke into a small, appreciative smile. Harding concluded the introductions. Supporting them will be elements from Zulu 9. Their experience with the local fauna and reputation should speak for themselves. Now let's get to work. He gave a nod, signaling the beginning of the operational phase. The garage buzzed as the convoy prepared to depart. Personnel approached the wraps, conducting final inspections of their gear before jumping in. The Bradley-sized UGVs stood ready, awaiting their directives. Technicians conducted checks on their weapons systems, ensuring that the missile pods were fitted with both SACLOs and Hellfire units for a balanced loadout. Kelmethus, sharing a few last words with Perry, gestured towards a group of Cenarans climbing into carriages led by lizard-like pack animals. Our Dratics are prepared, and my knights stand ready. Together we ensure a secure passage. With measured steps, he headed into the lead MRAP. Henry followed behind Kelmethus, claiming shotgun as he sat next to Ron, who was already seated at the wheel. All set? With a thumbs up, Ron responded. Systems are green, Captain. Just waiting for the Cenarans. The Dradix ahead let out a strange cry a mix between a roar and a neigh before trotting forward and leaving the confines of the rudimentary base. The American vehicles followed closely behind, their speed limited by those of the Cenaran mounts. The outside landscape, a blend of Gera's unique but familiar flora and fauna, served as a serene backdrop to their journey. This terrain really makes me feel like I'm in one of those ice guys, Ron mused, taking in the pristine European-like countryside ahead. Dr. Anderson leaned back, shifting around to make space for Kelmuth's staff. I've seen a lot of great environments, but nothing quite like this. I'd say this is straight out of a Tolkien work. Though the ecosystem here is mind-bogglingly diverse, nothing like anything I've read so far. A bit too diverse for my liking. The wildlife is hella aggressive, Henry commented. I'd rather not have another Fenworm surprise. Kelmuthus chimed in. The scrying accomplished by your drones should still hold true. It is unlikely we will see a surprise assault on the scale of the one at the ruins. The incident there was unique. As long as we do not use mana to the extent of the artifact, we need not worry about luring beasts. Perry spoke, peeling away from the scenery at the window. We should arrange a joint training session sometime. Exchange some best practices. We can show you our tactics, and you could teach us how to develop magic capacity. Kelmuthus laughed before clearing his throat. Pardon me, Ambassador, but learning magic might be more of a challenge for you than you think. All inhabitants of this realm are born with some level of mana. I do not know how well our teachings and methods of training would apply to those without mana. But, I'd be curious to see one of your drones up close. Henry glanced at a screen displaying the drone's feed. That can be arranged. But right now, our focus should be on that forested region up ahead. Kelmethus, you mentioned adventurers frequenting areas like these? Yeah. How exactly do adventurers work around here? Ron seconded Henry's question, interested more in the conversation than the road. All eyes turned, hungry for lore about this world. The archmage chuckled, his gaze momentarily shifting to the forests outside. Ah, uh, adventurers. Quite the diverse lot, bound by thrill and challenge. They generally operate from the cities, enrolling in guilds that assign them quests. These quests can be anything seeking ancient relics in forgotten tombs, collecting materials or herbs, handling rogue beasts that trouble villages, even assisting townsfolk with larger tasks. In return, they earn both coin and recognition, advancing through established tiers as they gain experience. Dr. Anderson adjusted a pair of glasses, his scholarly curiosity piqued. These tiers, they signify some sort of ranking system? Kelmuthus nodded. Precisely. An adventurer starts at the lower echelons, say tier 2 or 3, and as they complete quests and prove their mettle, they ascend the ranks. Achieving tier 10 status isn't trivial, it's a testament to an adventurer's skills and renown. Most in Elderlore would accord significant respect to a high-tiered adventurer, 
especially one who could rival a company of knights and mages. Ron smirked, glancing at the passengers behind him and then back to the road. Sounds like a fantasy MMO. He turned toward Henry. Maybe you'll finally enjoy the genre once you experience it in real life, dude. Kelmuthus raised an eyebrow. MMO? Ron attempted to explain. They're games, but simulated. He paused, searching for a way to relate the concept to the Archmage. Imagine a scrying spell that allows you to see a different realm. Within this realm, you can control a version of yourself, much like a golem. This golem-like avatar can interact with others, go on quests, and face challenges, all within this fabricated world. Millions from Earth participate in these simulations at the same time, interacting with each other, but all within the safety of this make-believe environment. Kelmuthus looked intrigued. A fascinating concept. So these MMOs, they allow individuals to experience adventures without real consequences? Yeah, it's a way for a lot of people to escape reality, Ron said. Kelmuthus nodded. Oh, if only we had such abilities. The perils adventurers face here are undeniably real. Forests such as the one we're approaching are rife with both treasures and threats. They tend to attract both fledgling adventurers eager for recognition and seasoned ones searching for rarer challenges. Perry interjected. Given these forests are often frequented by adventurers, how should we perceive them? Potential allies, possible threats? Kelmuthus pondered for a brief moment before responding. Likely allies. All adventurers sign contracts during the registration process. By signing, the adventurer agrees to stipulated terms, which often include clauses about the respectful treatment of locals and abiding by local laws. Violations of these contracts incur damning consequences. While there may be some unscrupulous individuals within the guild, they would never dare devolve into banditry. Most adventurers are helpful souls who would come to the aid of those in need. Huh, guess we won't have to worry about getting betrayed by party members for being useless, eh? Ron quipped. Kalmuthus opened his mouth to respond, but a sudden forceful impact against the rap's window cut him off. An arrow, glowing with a slight luminescence, slammed into the reinforced pane and embedded itself within the layers, leaving behind a spiderweb pattern on its surface. Before anyone could react, another louder thud resonated, causing the entire vehicle to shudder. Looking ahead, they witnessed a massive boulder crashing down on one of the Sanaran carriages, splintering it under its immense weight. Almost simultaneously, the once stable ground beneath them morphed, turning into a sludgy mess that gripped the MRAP's tires and tugged at the Sanaran Dradix. The dense, oppressive green of the forest came alive with enemy movement, forming a claustrophobic corridor of potential threats on all sides. From the tree lean, a blazing streak of light unmistakably a fireball hurtled toward one of the UGVs. Upon impact, it exploded with a force reminiscent of a WW2-era bazooka. The flames and smoke danced around the UGV, the sheer force of the blast creating a concussive wave. However, the vehicle's armor held, showing damage no more superficial than some scorch marks. Arrows and sharp stones flew at the convoy as earthen spikes erupted from the ground. But against the American vehicles, these attacks left mere dents and marks. The sudden impacts jolted everyone inside. As Ron repositioned the vehicle in a staggered defensive formation alongside the other MRAPs and UGVs, Henry immediately reached for the doors and barked orders. Ambush! Three and nine. Dismount and take cover. Bandits! Kelmuthus exclaimed. Prepare yourselves! A whistling arrow barely had time to embed itself into the MRAP's armored skin before Henry was in motion. Perry Anderson, stay close. Ron, stick with the knights. Door latch released, rifle up, boots hitting dirt. The transition was seamless. He pressed his back to the MRAP's thick tire eyes darting through the scope. Before Henry could even shout an order, Zulu-9 was already laying down fire at the tree leans. No pause, no hesitation, just the guttural thump of .50 caliber turrets alongside 30mm autocannons and the strident echoes of rifles firing in unison. 
Accompanying it was a translucent barrier of magical energy, hastily conjured by the Sanera knights as they filled in the gaps between and beside the wraps. Tapping the trigger, Henry's XM7 spat 6.8 millimeters at silhouettes darting through the trees, each shot a calculated elimination. Perry and Anderson hunkered behind another MRAP, flanked by Ron and a duo of Sanera knights. In seconds, the forest edge had been transformed into a graveyard of felled bandits and smoldering trees. Without missing a beat, Henry snatched his radio. Pioneer to Armstrong, Tango Mike. Magic users confirmed, heavy contact. Uploading coordinates. Ten mics from Elderlore. Request immediate QRF. A voice on the other end crackled to life. Armstrong to Pioneer, copy all. QRF spinning up. ETA 20 minutes. Henry tucked the radio back, his gaze flitting between the forest line and his HUD where the coordinates blinked, uploaded. Armstrong, pioneer copies. Make it quick, he responded. His eyes narrowed as he reviewed his team's positions, a tactical overlay alive on his visor. Everyone was holding, but 20 minutes was a lifetime in a firefight. A guttural scream echoed in the forest cut short by the percussive drum of a .50 Cal Henry continued to sweep the burning greenery for more signs of enemy activity, catching a glimpse of a red circle hovering in the air. Mage, two o'clock by the large boulder, fifty meters. A heartbeat later, the nearby thud of an antimaterial rifle followed. One mage crumbled, a plume of red mist replacing where his head and neck had been. Another recoiled, clutching a bullet wound in his shoulder his incantation faltering. Nice shot, Hayes, Henry praised, eyes still trained for the next threat. Knights hold position, their magics faltering. Suddenly, he heard a scream of agony beside him. Man down! Medic on me! Covering fire! Henry barked. The downed soldier was quickly dragged back by Yen and Hayes, laying him behind the safety of an MRAP, his arm bleeding profusely. Yen was on him like a shadow, hastily unzipping his medical bag. Hang in there, Harris, he muttered, prepping a morphine auto-injector and jabbing it into the man. You'll feel a little sting, he said, but the soldier hardly seemed to notice. His face was a contorted mask of pain and adrenaline. After quickly cleaning the wound with antiseptic wipes, Yen looked up. He's ready for you. A Sanarin knight stepped forward. Incantation spilled from his lips as he chanted about vitality and life. His hands, hovering over the wounded arm, began to glow with a soft yellow aura. A wave of light washed over Harris, the glow intensifying around the wound. The skin seemed to knit itself back together, the torn muscle fibers rejoining. A war cry tore Henry's attention away from the miracle. Silhouettes of warriors, moving with inhuman speed, dashed from the trees as the rain of arrows and spells died down. Despite their enhancements, their swift advance was cut short. The lead storm from the convoy's guns, combined with the larger rounds from the MRP turrets and UGV autocannons, halted them in their tracks. As the intensity peaked, a distinct whistle sliced through the noise, followed by discernible shifts in the forest. The bandits, who moments ago were launching a determined onslaught, began pulling back rapidly, their forms fleeting as they melted away into the dense woods. Cease fire, cease fire, Henry's voice thundered. His vision pierced the diminishing smoke, the scope of his rifle scanning the tree lean. He could see the figures receding what remained of the bandit force. He then turned to his men. Status report. One of Zula Nine spoke up. Too injured, but they're good now thanks to that magic. Roger that. Henry rallied his men. Secure the perimeter. Zulu 9, cover all flanks. Get some drones in the air. While Zulu 9 members and Sanarin Knights promptly established a 360 degree security perimeter around the convoy, the drones overhead maintained vigilant scans of the retreating bandits, ensuring no immediate threats lurked nearby. Vehicle check! Ron shouted already inspecting the MRAP he had driven. Teams began evaluating the convoy vehicles. The UGVs, though splattered with mud and marked with scorch marks, 
appeared operational. The Sanarin carriages avoided destruction, enemy attention having been diverted toward the deadlier American vehicles instead. Henry's gaze shifted to Kelnithus. He stood tall, shimmering staff in hand, conferring briefly with one of his knights. He then turned to survey the battlefield, his eyes lingering on the gore past the convoy's perimeter. He spoke softly to a wounded knight before placing a hand on the man's shoulder. A soft glow emanated from his palm, and the knight visibly relaxed. Kelmethus then caught Henry's eye and walked over. There was a solemnity in his gaze, one that told of a man who'd seen the horrors of battle and found them wanting. But there was something else respect, perhaps, or the recognition of an uncomfortable truth. Henry could only speculate, but whatever it was, it suggested the day's events had left an indelible mark not just on the knights but the archmage as well. The forest had gone quiet now, save for the distant chatter of birds resuming their interrupted songs. Archmage? Your weapons, he mused, his voice tinged with both respect and revulsion. Make even the wildest magic seem tame. It's as if they've channeled the unforgiving, indiscriminate wrath of nature itself. Henry took in the fallen trees and the smoky air. We've engineered them to be effective. It's not about fair fights, it's about ending them before they escalate. Yes, Kelmethus said, removing the arrow from the cracked window. On that, our realms find common ground. This was no mere opportunistic attack. Their sorcery was too refined. The level of coordination speaks not of banditry, he observed. Henry nodded going over the surroundings. Let's ensure we're secure first. Then we'll dive deeper into who and why. Think you can clear the mud out and move the boulders ahead? Kalmathus nodded and took a deep breath, walking along the mud-engulfed path. He extended his hands, fingers splayed, and raised his staff. The air around him shimmered, vibrating with energy. Slowly, the thick mud began to recede condensing back into solid ground. Simultaneously, he directed his attention to the boulders obstructing the way. With a focused, sweeping motion, the ground beneath them shifted, causing the massive rocks to roll to the side of the path, creating a clear passageway. He made his way back to Henry. It is done! Henry gave him a nod of appreciation before reaching for his radio. Pioneer to Armstrong, Situation Green. Ambush repelled path clear. A brief silence ensued before a response came through. Armstrong copies Pioneer. Cast reps? For minor injuries, equipment operational. Proceeding to Elderlore. Copy that, Pioneer. Continue to update. QRF en route, ETA 2 minutes. We'll rendezvous and provide escort. Armstrong out. Ron approached Henry. Yo, we gonna move forward or we gonna retrograde? We're moving forward. QRF's gonna join us. Henry stowed the radio, addressing the team with urgency. Mount up and move out. Stay alert. We're not out of the woods yet. The team quickly regrouped, the familiar hum of engines filling the atmosphere, meshing with the low murmurs of discussions and the rhythmic clinking of armor. Everyone got into formation, preparing to continue the journey. As the convoy began to move again, Perry turned to Kelmethus, who sat by the cracked window. You mentioned earlier that this wasn't just a mere bandit attack, Archmage? Kelmethus replied. Indeed, Ambassador. Their tactics were too coordinated, the spells they wielded too refined. They were organized. Perry nodded slowly. Could they be affiliated with a larger power or entity? Kelmuth's side looking at the cracked window to his side. I have my suspicions, though it's too early to say. Their knowledge of magic, especially the more strategic spells, he said, touching the window, might suggest connections to one of the major players in South Enif. Most likely the Nobian Empire, given their proficiently planned ambush, but that's merely conjecture at this point. Archmage, regarding the individuals your knights have detained, it might be mutually beneficial for us to jointly understand their motives. Would it be possible for our teams to collaborate in gathering information from them? Henry looked back and added on. 
it's imperative we understand the full scope of this attack. We have methods and techniques that might be unfamiliar to yours, which could yield results. Kelmuthus raised a brow, intrigued. A valid point, Captain. I'll speak with our knights about arranging an interrogation that includes both Sonarans and Americans. The convoy transitioned from the dense canopy of the forest to a path that gradually unfurled into sprawling vistas on either side. Fields of golden grain swayed gently, and distant herders guided flocks along the rolling hills. But it was the sight ahead that captured Henry's full attention, the majestic city of Elderlore. Towering spires rose skyward, their intricate stonework hinting at skills and craftsmanship long perfected. The formidable walls, battle-scarred and time-worn, watched over a line of visitors, citizens, and merchants at the gates. The MRAP's engine purred as it slowed its pace, joining the line behind merchant caravans pulled by sturdy dratics, their laden carts filled with vibrant textiles and exotic goods. Nearby, farmers in sun-worn hats looked up from tending to their fields, their expressions oscillating between curiosity and astonishment. Guards, with crests emblazoned on their armor, patrolled the city gates, casting wary glances at the unfamiliar convo. Passing adventurers paused to gawk, only to be turned away by the Kelmethus knights. Ron leaned into the wheel, his face getting closer to the windshield as he looked out in awe. So we're finally here. Henry followed Ron's gaze, taking in the sight and pulling out a camera to snap a picture. Perry and the other passengers looked out their windows, similarly entranced by the otherworldly view. Indeed, Kelmethus said, unfastening his seatbelt. Welcome to the city of Elderlore. Chapter 3 The Sonaran Federation Elderlore, Sonaran Federation November 10, 2024 Kelmuth's boots met the smooth gravel road as the ambient sounds of the city voices of traders, footsteps, and distant laughter formed a backdrop. Upon seeing the archmage, the guards by the gate immediately stiffened and presented a deep, synchronized bow, their spears held vertically in salute. Ambassador Perry, holding a radio in one hand and his clipboard in the other, pressed a button. Pioneer to Armstrong, this is Perry. We've arrived at Elderlore and are currently at the entrance. Ron's hand remained on the wheel, his attention focused on the exchange outside. Once the Archmage signals, we'll move up. Henry directed a question to Perry. Are we expecting any additional formalities during our stay? Perry released the radio button, allowing it to hang by his side. Kelmethus should smooth things over. I'll handle most of the talking. As long as you don't say anything, out of pocket around the nobles, we should be fine. Henry nodded and looked back to the front. Outside the MRAP, the wind picked up, rustling the banners that hung from the city walls one of the star-studded flag of the Sonaran Federation and another of the local duchy. Kelmuthus approached the guards, waving his hand. The guards eased up at the sign and the one with an intricate design on his armor stepped forward. Archmage Kelmuthus the guard began. It is an honor to receive you and your guests. He eyed them wraps behind Kelmuthus. Kelmuthus offered a nod. Indeed, Captain Arlen, these are the esteemed delegates mentioned in the Ethergraph message. Their realm is not unlike ours, with its share of adversities and triumphs. Let us show them our hospitality. Dr. Anderson peered through the window as the conversation took place and murmured to Henry. Look at the other guards. They're trying hard not to look our way, but you can see they're curious. The youngest ones can barely contain it. Ron leaned back in his seat. Bet they've never seen these metal carriages before, huh? Just wait till they catch a glimpse of our steel dragons. Who knows? Perry responded, leaning his arm on the door. It's possible they're familiar with the concept if they are aware that dwarves have steam engines. Though, it might be best not to disrupt the local societies with our technologies. Our guidelines still emphasize a policy of minimal interference. As Kelmuth's conversation wrapped up, Arlen signaled to a couple of guards who were manning a sturdy wooden barrier arm. Operating a windlass, they lifted the barrier and stepped aside to make space for the convo. Kelmuthus took a moment to exchange a few more words with Captain Arlen before gesturing to the convo. Ron revved the engine softly, 
edging the vehicle forward to pick up Kelmethis. Local knight Sandradix led the convo, the afternoon sun painting everything in a warm light as they exited the wall's shadow. Henry fixed his gaze outside, taking in every detail of Elderlore's lively streets. The ride was smooth. Unlike the rugged terrain during the journey here, the roads had a solidness to them. It was made of compacted gravel. Henry wondered how the Cenarans managed to create something so reminiscent of familiar asphalt back home. Magical lights and signs at junctions provided guidance, giving some semblance of order in the busy city. As they moved, the tantalizing aroma of baked goods, roasted meats, and herbs wafted from open-air eateries. In the distance, the rhythmic sound of a blacksmith's hammer met Henry's ears, interrupted by a chime of a bell from a nearby tower. Unique establishments lined the streets of store with a potion drawn on a sign outside, another with drawings of tools and cutlery. Beside them stood a butchery, complete with slabs of alien meat and wagons waiting by the front door. They then passed by a blacksmith, furnace belching smoke as a mage stoked the flames within. All of the buildings were characterized by a unique blend of Baroque and high medieval architecture exactly what Ron had shown him in clips of various anime and movies. Dr. Anderson scribbled down constant notes in between snaps of photos, mouth hanging slightly open as he immersed himself in the fantastical environment. This place... It's like stepping back in time, yet everything's so alive. For real. Ron slowed down as a group of adventurers walked past, ogling at the convoy just as much as Ron ogled at them. Though he wasn't as busy as Dr. Anderson, Henry could only guess how excited he must have been. They approached a wide square with a towering fountain at its center, water spouting from the maws of a hydra carved with intricate detail. The sound of cascading water filled the square mingling with local conversations. Ambassador Perry leaned out the window to get a better view. The Archmage wasn't kidding when he said this city was rich in history. Just hope they're as rich in cat girls or elven baddies. Ron trailed off, the last words in his sentence inaudible to all but Henry. Henry nearly did a double take. Bro what? Ron cleared his throat. Uh, just hope they're as rich in hospitality. Ahem. He steered the MRP skillfully through a tighter street, which then opened up to a wider road. So, uh, where are we headed? Kelmethus answered. We are headed to the grand abode of Duke Vansa at Stein. Though not his primary residence. His generosity has extended to provide lodgings for your esteemed delegation. Henry nodded as the heart of Elderlore gave way to a distinctly affluent district. Buildings, crafted from stone and crowned with pointed arches, were interspersed with broad driveways. Commerce and chatter were abundant as they made their way through. He could see ornate entrances leading into shops and high-end boutiques, frequented by wealthy merchants or nobles. They picked up a bit of speed, continuing to follow the knights ahead until they entered a path that seemed much more maintained than the busy city roads they had left behind. As they continued, the sweeping visage of an opulent mansion unveiled itself. The mansion's entrance boasted an ornate gate, guarded by statuesque figures. They were accompanied by magical lights on each side which cast reflections over meticulously tended gardens. Tall towers loomed on either end of the mansion, overlooking the surrounding walls. Resplendent in their gleaming armor, guards stood sentry by the gate and within the courtyard. The convoy slowed down coming to a graceful halt before the gateway. Henry observed as Kalmathus stepped out to speak with the mansion's guards. The conversation was brief, with one of the guards giving a curt nod before signaling for the gates to be opened. As they slowly creaked open, Henry's gaze fell upon the courtyard, taking note of its layout and the placement of attendants who awaited them. The vehicles rumbled to a stop, and Henry was the first to disembark. The ground was firm underfoot feeling like asphalt or concrete. Attendants in modest tunics and blazers approached him and the rest of the delegation. One of them, a middle-aged man with graying hair, stepped forward. He had elongated ears that ended in a point. Similar to a Vulcan, Henry mused, though Elf would probably be more appropriate. He didn't even need to look at Ron to know he was on the verge of wedding himself overseeing his first Elf. Greetings, esteemed travelers. 
and welcome to the guest mansion of Duke Vanser. I am Roland, head steward of this establishment. Please, allow me to guide you to your lodgings. Ambassador Perry extended his hand with a smile. Thank you, Roland. I am Ambassador Perry, representing the United States of America. We appreciate the hospitality. He gestured to Henry. This is Captain Henry Doniger, our head of security. Henry gave a curt nod, replying, Lead the way, Roland. He cast a glance at the other attendants, assessing them. Roland gestured towards the mansion. This way. As they started the short walk toward the building, Roland pointed to some of the mansion's architectural features. Although this is a guest residence, Duke Vanser commissioned artisans from across the Federation to work on its construction, ensuring comfort and security for esteemed visitors. Henry, staying close to Ambassador Perry, took in his surroundings. The mansion was surrounded by a low stone wall, the top of which was decorated with intricate, leafy designs that shimmered ever so slightly under the sunlight likely some magical enchantment. The wall clearly offered a layer of redundancy if the outer walls were ever breached, yet maintained the aesthetic of the courtyard. He eyed Dr. Anderson. Sure enough, he was marveling over the designs. Their path led to a massive wooden door, flanked by two guards with spears at the ready. Their armor was ornate but practical, and their focused gazes never left the delegation, taking stock just as he was. Not a word was exchanged between them and Roland, but they effortlessly swung the doors open at his approach. The main hall beyond was grand but not ostentatious. High vaulted ceilings loomed above, supported by thick wooden beams, and the polished marble floor was interrupted only by lush rugs that muffled their steps. Light streamed in from tall windows, lending warmth to the otherwise cool space. Henry's eyes drifted to a couple of doorways branching off the main hall, likely leading to other chambers. His eyes then jumped to the spiral staircase, then another door, taking mental notes of the mansion's layout, possible exit points, and vulnerabilities. Kelmethus had demonstrated himself to be trustworthy so far, but he couldn't reliably say the same about everyone else especially not after the recent bandit ambush. Though he didn't outright distrust their hosts, it also didn't hurt to be prepared. Ryan, walking a step behind, leaned in. This place seems sturdy. Good vantage points, he commented in a low voice. Henry nodded, whispering back. Let's not make any assumptions. We'll review the grounds later. Roland paused in the center of the hall, gesturing toward the artwork adorning the walls. Duke Vansa possesses a fondness for the arts. These tapestries depict significant moments in the history of the Sanaran Federation. He led the group toward a particular painting, its grandeur outshining its neighbors and housed within a finely carved wooden frame. It showcased a noble figure upon a magnificent throne, his brow crowned with intertwined gold and silver. Encircling him, nobles from all corners engaged in fervent conversation. Some conveyed their points with animated gestures, while others remained still lending earnest ears. This, Roland began with a touch of solemnity, is the revered High Council. Behold King Elthrin at Celios as he sought discourse with the nobles of old Sonara, a time where unity was wrought from dire need. Henry scrutinized the assembly in the painting. An alliance was forged? Indeed, Captain, Roland responded with a gentle nod. The former kingdom of Sonara, though rich in heritage and bounty, was riven by discord. The great lords, sovereigns in their own right, were often at odds, each vying for influence. Foreign nations, keenly aware of our inner strife, endeavored to exploit this to their own ends. Dr. Anderson analyzed the paintings with childlike wonder, noting the foreign banners woven into the backdrop. External threats compelled them to rally together. Verily, continued Roland, the fractures within rendered us susceptible. In wisdom, King Elthrin envisioned the birth of the Sanaran Federation, granting autonomy to lords and their dominions in exchange for a pledge of fealty to the federal government. Ambassador Perry raised an eyebrow, a smile growing on his face. Interesting. So these lords, or governors, manage their own region yet unite under a central authority during pressing matters? Aye, a close likeness. As the years waned, 
surrounding nations aspired to join our fold, be it for security, commerce, or shared faith. Immersed in the lore, Ron asked, Shared faith? Roland indicated the sun emblem, glowing subtly in the painting. Sola, goddess of the sun, of light, and of life. She bathes our lands in her light and wisdom. Her teachings bind us, standing stark against the shadowy beliefs of the worshippers of Lenara, who have taken root in the Nobian Empire. Henry caught the undercurrents of tension in Roland's tone. The Nobian Empire. Kalmathus had mentioned this name after the ambush. He looked at Perry, brows furrowed and arms crossed. He wasn't the only one who wanted answers on these mysterious Nobians. What can you tell us about the Nobian Empire? He ventured. Roland's smile faded, his eyes becoming hard. The Nobian Empire, once a mere collection of territories, has of late risen in might and ambition. Their embrace of Lenara, the goddess of the night and darkness, fuels their growing audacity. It is whispered that some within the Empire seek greater power and influence. Dr. Anderson crossed his arms. The dossier on the Nobian Empire says the same thing but it didn't really go into depth on current geopolitics aside from their basic history. Kelmethus, who stood at a little distance, gave a slight bow. My apologies for the oversight, doctor. In penning that dossier, I endeavored to remain impartial. In truth, we believe that they covet Sanaran lands, and with it, its history and magics. However, this assertion remains uncorroborated, for the Nobians have spurned our overtures of diplomacy. Alas, our interactions with them have been but minor frays and skirmishes upon the Grendon Plains. The implications of Kalmuth's statement were clear to Henry, especially considering the fact that the ruins and their base were smack dab in the middle of the Grendon Plains. Is that something we're gonna have to worry about? Kalmuthus shook his head. The Nobians have not ventured into those lands for many a year. However, the possibility lingers that they might tread there once again. The ambush bore hallmarks of their tactics, and I must concede that discerning their movements has been a challenge of late. Ryan took a step forward, his voice rough and tinged with southern drawl as he spoke. With all due respect, an ambush of that damn scale indicates a significant breach of operational security. Who knew of our arrival? Are those other graph things secure? Is it possible the message was intercepted? Kalmathus adjusted his stance. I share your concern, Sir Hayes. We took every precaution, but it seems word spread to nefarious ears. The other graphs are indeed secure. There lies no possibility of interception. Dot. He lowered his voice. It is probable there are Nobian spies within the ranks of the local guards. Roland stepped in, putting on a smile and holding his hands up. Worry not, everyone here is under the personal employ of Duke Vansa himself. There is no risk of betrayal here. Isaac eyed a pair of guards patrolling outside the building. Still, perhaps holding our discussions at the base would be a wiser choice. The security there is more familiar. Henry frowned, assessing the room, while Perry cleared his throat. Look, I understand the concerns, but consider this. Pulling out now and heading to Armstrong Base might send the wrong message to the Sanarans. They might see it as a slight. The last thing we need is to strain this delicate, historical relationship from the get-go. We cannot allow humanity's first interplanetary contact to be a failure. He paused, taking a brief moment to gauge the reactions of those around him. Also, moving now could expose us even more. Elverlore has its defenses, and we've got Captain Donager's team and their gear, plus the good Archmage. We should play it smart and leverage the security we have right here rather than risking the journey back. Ryan shrugged. I still think Isaac's right, but the ambassador does have a point. This location has a lot of open lines of sight and great vantage points. Minimal risk of intruders even getting close to the gates. Your call, Captain. Henry scratched his neck. He initiated all of this and with Perry's justification and Ryan's support, he simply had to see it through. All right, we'll stay and hold the meetings here. But we hightail it back to base at the first sign of trouble. Perry placed a hand on Henry's shoulder. Thank you, Captain. Roland, 
sensing the moment of tension had passed, gestured gracefully to an archway leading further into the mansion. Pray, follow me and I shall conduct you to the chambers prepared for your repose. They passed by more indistinct hallways and adjoining rooms before finally arriving at their living quarters, which faced the conference room, training hall, and bath. Roland opened the door to one of the bedrooms, revealing the luxuries within. Herein lie your quarters, diligently prepared to ensure your rest and solace. We have assigned one bedroom to each person, he declared, the rich timbre of his voice hinting at pride. They are furnished with all that might be requisite for your comfort. Should any additional need arise, do not hesitate to summon our attendants, who stand ever ready to serve. Henry looked in awe. It was as one would expect for a noble's bedroom, massive white spaces, sophisticated decorations, a large and comfortable bed, and made standing at attention. Everything was surprisingly fit for modern standards, with magical lighting attached to a switch. Even the bathroom had proper plumbing, including a toilet and shower. Dr. Anderson was utterly intrigued by this anachronism, closely studying the design of those amenities and jotting down notes. Henry then turned to Ambassador Perry, who seemed the most unfazed by this display, offering only a smile and a handshake to express his gratitude. We are much obliged for your hospitality, Roland. Roland, with a refined nod of his head, replied, The honor is ours, Sir Perry. Please remember, in an hour's time, dinner shall be served in our grand hall. Until then, be it your wish to explore these venerable halls or simply relax, you have our leave. As Roland strolled down the hallway, the delegation's members dispersed to investigate their immediate surroundings. Henry took a few steps inside of his bedroom, surveying its intricacies. His hand grazed the bedspread, feeling the fine, cool texture. He could hear the distant chatter of his colleagues some of the rooms further down discussing their quarters. Ron Ambledon, leaning by the open door. Fancy as hell, right? Kinda makes you forget we're on a diplomatic mission. Henry smirked, glancing at the maids who stood attentively at the room's corner. You must be so excited, huh? Bruh, Ron said. I may be a weeb, but that doesn't mean I'm a degenerate. Henry clapped his friend on the shoulder as he walked out of his bedroom. Sure thing, buddy. Anyway, I think I know where to establish our command post. He gestured to the adjoining conference room. Bookshelves dominated the walls, no doubt filled with tales ripe for an eager Anderson. Perry and Kalmuthus were already seated at the elongated table in the center and engaged in earnest discussion. At the far end, a lone window loomed, overlooking the courtyard below. Seems like the most practical choice. It's right between all our rooms a nice central spot to strategize and monitor everything from. Speaking of which, he waved a hand to Isaac and Ryan, who were checking the room for possible bugs. Yo! Yen Hayes! Henry called out, beckoning to them as he walked toward Kelmethus and Perry. Captain! Ryan nodded, approaching the table. I'm thinking of setting up here. Henry said, taking in the room's layout. Looks solid, Ryan agreed. I let's get these babies rolling, Isaac said, pulling out electronics from a bag and setting it on the table. Nudging Ryan, he motioned with his chin to the walls. You think this old stone's gonna mess with the signal? Nah, dude, doubt it, Ryan said, glancing over to Kelmethus. Do know about the enchantments and stuff, though. The archmage looked out at the wall outside. Dr. Lamar's testing yielded little evidence of interference. I know not of the natural philosophies behind your mechanisms, but her judgment appeared sound. Henry nodded. Just in case, though, would you mind having some of your knights take up shifts here? Your recommendation holds wisdom. I will reassign some of my men from the perimeter patrols. Our insight into the ether may prove useful. All right. Henry glanced at his watch. We'll reconvene here ten minutes before dinner. Should be enough time for a review of our plans and local etiquette. Dr. Anderson, having momentarily been lost in a tome from a shelf, reluctantly shut it and approached the table. No time for a quick tour of the library, then? Henry shook his head, grinning slightly. Priorities, doctor. But we'll see. 
As everyone prepared for the upcoming dinner, Henry turned away from the conference table and made his way back to his room. The day had been long, and a wash before dinner seemed a prudent choice. As he stepped into the bathroom, the sheer opulence of it made him momentarily forget he was in a foreign world gleaming marble tiles, a tub that looked hand-carved, and various vials and jars containing substances he didn't recognize. As he closed the door and undressed, he considered trying out the mysterious liquids but instead pulled his own shampoo and soap from a bag. What caught his attention, however, was the shower. There were no knobs or handles, just a set of intricately designed glyphs arranged in a circle, with three major ones laid out in a row. Maybe he missed the handle? He searched for one to no avail. He then touched one glyph, hoping for water to start pouring, but nothing happened. After a few futile attempts, he realized he might need some assistance. Clearing his throat and putting his clothes back on, he stepped out and noticed one of the maids still lingering nearby. Excuse me, he began. I seem to be having some trouble with the shower. Could you help? The maid, a young woman with bright hazel eyes and a gentle smile, stepped into the bathroom and glanced at the glyphs. She nodded, placing her hand over the third glyph in the row. With a glow, it slowly spun to life. Water poured out of the shower head, already tuned to a comfortable temperature. The bathing systems here call upon the essence of mana. Unfortunately, without innate magic, one would need an external touch. She produced a small, radiant blue crystal from a pocket in her attire and handed it to Henry. We use mana crystals like this to operate more mana-intensive equipment, but you can hold on to this. Hold the crystal near the glyphs to supply it with magic energy, then select your desires upon the glyphs. Henry accepted the crystal, the strange object exuding a soft pulse. Thank you, he said, noting the warmth of the object. I'm not quite used to this. The maid chuckled softly. Fear not. We were briefed about the vast divides between our realms. The first glyph commands the warmth of the water, the second its vigor, and should you wish it cease, press the crystal to the third. With an appreciative nod, Henry said, I think I've got it from here. Thanks again. She bowed slightly. Always at your service. Should further assistance be sought, merely voice it. May you enjoy your bath. Left alone again. Henry examined the crystal for a moment before following her instructions. Henry smiled like a kid using a new toy as he operated the shower. It was more like someone on a starship using holograms to control things rather than magic. As he showered, all he could think of was how conveniently modern the plumbing was and how grateful he was that he didn't have to reduce himself to shitting in a bucket. Feeling refreshed, he dried off and dressed in his official attire giving another nod to the maid as he walked to the conference room. Upon entering, he noticed the members of his team busily setting up the equipment. The elongated table was now covered in wires, displays, and various electronic devices. Perry and Kalmathus were still engrossed in conversation, but now with some blueprints spread out before them. Ron, reading one of the books from the shelves, looked up at Henry's entrance. You figure out the restroom on your own? Henry grinned, recalling his brief mishap. Nah. Had to ask the maid to turn it on for me. He pulled out the mana crystal. Turns out their things run on mana so we gotta use these. Ron gave a shrug, his smile giving way to a chuckle. Well, at least you didn't mess up like Jankowski. The guys are calling him Royal Flush now. Pretty sure that's gonna stick for a while. Henry stifled a laugh. Shit, what happened? Dude took a crap, and couldn't flush it cause he didn't have one of those crystals. Maid had to come in and take care of it for him, and the rumor spread from there. Good thing he brought his own toilet paper, or else the maid would have had to wipe his ass for him. Ouch. Henry responded, still struggling to contain his laughter. And here I thought figuring out the shower was a challenge. Anderson approached, overhearing the conversation. It's truly fascinating, isn't it? The existence of magic here led to new technological developments otherwise impossible. I can only imagine what that means for their culture, economy, and warfare. Henry's head lowered subtly at that word. Warfare. 
He turned the mana crystal in his hand, letting the blue light refract through his fingers. Yeah, that's a significant concern. We got lucky with the bandit ambush. There's no telling what else magic is capable of. Could be at a serious disadvantage if shit hits the fan. That's what our Sanarin buddies hopefully are for, right? Ron lightly jabbed his elbow at Henry. Henry shrugged. Yeah, I guess so. All right, let's prepare for our review. Yen Hayes? Ryan replied as he typed away at a laptop. Cameras are installed at all the main hallways and junctions. We've also got motion sensors and infrared lasers positioned near entrances and windows. Any suspicious activity will give us silent alerts. We've already informed the attendants to steer clear from these areas at night. Archmage? My knights stand ready to assist, Kelmethus affirmed. They have thoroughly vetted each member of the mansion staff and found no irregularities. I dare say, we need not fear any obstacles. Henry, satisfied with the setup, nodded. Excellent work, everyone. Ambassador, he gestured to Perry, allowing him to take over. Quick refresher, Perry announced. Remember to avoid direct political discussions and stick to our main goals. And please, do not mention the Nobian Empire. There won't be any other guests at this dinner aside from ourselves, but I'd still like everyone to treat this dinner like a black tie event. Thankfully, Sonoran etiquette is compatible with our own, so I expect everyone to conduct themselves accordingly. Given our different cultures, misunderstandings are bound to occur, but let's handle them with tact. A knock on the door interrupted the briefing. The door opened to reveal Roland, who gave a deep bow. I trust our accommodations have been to your liking? He asked, allowing his gaze to briefly sweep over the room and the unfamiliar devices strewn across. Henry suppressed a smile, remembering the misfortune of royal flush. Indeed, Roland. We're just wrapping up here. Most fortuitous. The butler responded inclining his head gracefully. The banquet in the Grand Hall nears its commencement. It awaits you and your esteemed compatriots. While it shan't be graced with the presence of nobility, the repast has been prepared with utmost care to honor our distinguished guests. So we're basically nobles now, is what he's saying? Ryan whispered. Isaac muttered back a quick yeah as Perry responded to Roland. We appreciate the hospitality. Please lead the way. With Roland leading, they proceeded down the corridor and navigated through hallways and stairs until they reached the Grand Hall on the first floor. Upon entering, Henry was struck by its sheer magnificence. Towering ceilings, radiant chandeliers, tables adorned with an array of exotic dishes Roland wasn't kidding about the hospitality. Roland stepped forth, announcing to the other attendants present, Introducing the delegation of the United States of America and Archmage Kalmathus at Helis. The delegation spread out, taking their seats. Henry sat near the head of the table, alongside Perry and Kalmathus. The various small dishes arrayed in front of him bore familiar aromas and appearances, yet were undoubtedly different from anything on earth. One of the dishes had precisely cut slices of what looked like ribeye steak, but rather than the typical pink medium, it had a more purplish hue, like a dragon fruit. Kalmathus, noticing Henry's intrigued expression, softly said, That would be steak made from a cow. They're bovine creatures, akin to your cow. They graze in fields near concentrations of mana crystals, hence their unique hue. Henry nodded, taking a small portion and placing it onto his plate. The first bite was tender, and a subtle, beefy flavor danced on his tongue. The meat really did resemble beef, but it had a unique zest to it, something that he couldn't quite place. Across the table, Dr. Anderson examined a greenish broth filled with floating herbs. What might this be? A nearby attendant answered. Tis manfern soup, good sir. Made of calf stock and a rare herb used in crafting potions. It aids in replenishing mana and is favored by mages after intense spell casting. Dr. Purdue tested local food, right? We can eat manor-rich foods? Henry interjected. Kelmethus nodded. Indeed, her test concluded that your biology is compatible and that there are no adverse effects, and I concur. 
beings with low mana capacity do not absorb excess and instead excrete it. Ha! Huh. With his concerns alleviated, Henry returned to enjoying his meal. The clinking of silverware and soft murmurs of appreciation filled the grand hall as dishes were tasted and praised. Calmethus took a sip from his goblet, setting it down with a thoughtful look. He turned to Henry, his eyes briefly resting on his wristwatch a novelty to him, no doubt. These metal beasts of yours that patrol the perimeter, what are they? Henry set his fork down. They're called UGV's unmanned ground vehicles. They're controlled remotely, like the rover. Kelmuthus tilted his head back slightly. Ah, uh, so you have different types of golems at your disposal. But what are they animated by? Pure artifice? In a way, yes, Perry interjected, eager to explain. Similar to how magical energy powers your devices like the lights and shower, our machines rely on electrical energy. They're programmed by our own version of runes, I suppose. The archmage's gaze deepened, a slight frown forming. Machines. I've seen the wonders they achieve in your camp. It's fascinating and oddly familiar. Oddly familiar? Perry asked. The machines you describe are similar to those within the Gatebuilder's ruins. Though we believe them to be powered by a blend of spellwork and electrical energy. After a contemplative pause, Kelmuthus continued, Your kin are bereft of mana. How did you activate the gateway? Perry looked to Henry, who nodded slightly. Interestingly, we believe that we managed to activate it out of pure coincidence. One of our experiments happened to coincide with unknown energies. Our testing, Kelmuthus realized. Simultaneous experimentation culminating in an alignment of fate. Henry took a bite of something that tasted like chicken, listening to the exchange as he ate. The atmosphere grew warmer as the evening progressed. He could even feel himself relaxing a bit. While he focused on his food, his ears remained attuned to the conversations around him Ron asking about the ratio of female elves in the Adventurers Guild, Isaac somehow joining in on that topic, and Anderson learning more about Sanaran history from Roland. Just as the main course's remnants were cleared, Attendants brought forth the final dish of the evening. It looked remarkably like a chocolate tart, but the rich aroma wafting from it was unlike anything Henry had encountered before. In front of Kelmuthus, the dessert shimmered, imbued with faint traces of mana. Ron, sitting nearby, quirked an eyebrow. Is this some sort of mana chocolate tart? Kelmuthus grinned. Ah, that's a good name. It's a blend of dark urith cacao and infused with a pinch of starshade and herb known to aid in rejuvenation and relaxation. Henry, intrigued, took a cautious bite. The familiar bitterness of cacao melded seamlessly with a calming, ethereal sensation. It tasted a bit like Hershey's mixed with something akin to mint. It's extraordinary, he murmured, savoring the taste and sensation. Kelmuthus chuckled. It's a favorite among many. As the dessert course concluded, the delegation members began to rise from their seats. A few exchanged final pleasantries with maids or newly befriended knights, while others stretched and yawned. Henry could sense the undercurrent of exhaustion, especially from his own team. It had been a long and eventful day. Roland, having observed the proceedings with quiet dignity, stepped forward. I hope the repast found favor with your tastes. The banquet was prepared under the guidance of the esteemed Duke Vanser. While circumstance denies us his presence this eve, he has conveyed profound regret and extends his fervent wishes for a fruitful congregation on the morrow. Kelmuthus rose, nodding in Roland's direction. Roland, please extend our gratitude to the Duke. Tonight's gathering was splendid. Perry stood, extending a hand towards Kelmuthus. Thank you, Archmage, for the enlightening conversation. Kelmuthus shook it. Until the morrow. Henry stood up, sliding his chair in. Guided by the mansion staff, the delegation made their way through the corridors, the soft glow of magical lights casting elongated shadows upon the carpets beneath. Their footsteps echoed subtly, the stony walls of the mansion muting any surrounding sounds. As they approached the crossroads of hallways, Ron sidled up to Henry, keeping his voice low. 
Got Haze on first watch with a couple guys from Zulu 9. We're on a rotation. I'll relieve him in a few. Henry gave a curt nod, his eyes occasionally darting to the windows. Aight. Stay sharp, especially tonight. Copy that, Captain. The group continued its journey through the mansion, the sound of hushed conversations gradually waning as they reached their respective rooms. Henry, turning the ornate handle of his chamber's door, stepped inside, the gentle ambience of the room like that of stepping into a hotel room after a long flight. The plush bed, with its velvety blankets and embroidered pillows, seemed all too welcoming. Slipping off his uniform jacket and draping it over a chair, he took a moment, reflecting on the day's events. They'd repelled an ambush that was possibly orchestrated by a third faction, then made landfall in a fantastical city pulled straight out of one of Ron's animes. With the familiar weight of his sidearm on the nightstand and a pager nestled under his pillow, Henry settled into the bed. The cool fabric of the sheets seemed to draw the weariness from him. As the pull of sleep began to take hold, he took comfort in the knowledge that the men of Zulu 9 were keeping watch. Chapter 4 Intruders Eldralore, Sanarin Federation November 11, 2024 BZZT BZZT Henry felt a subtle vibration under his neck, groaning as his dream faded away. It took a couple seconds for his foggy mind to register the sensation, but once clarity hit, his eyes snapped open. The pager beneath his pillow was the source of the disruption a silent alarm was triggered. Heart rate elevating, he instantly shifted from half-consciousness to alert readiness. He grabbed his sidearm from the nightstand and pocketed his vibrating pager taking a swig from a water bottle before pushing off the covers. He grabbed his uniform from the chair and walked over to the closet, taking the tactical vest and rifle stashed within. With a pattern of knocks, the door opened a fraction, revealing Ron's silhouette. Trip laser, was all he offered. Henry nodded, securing his vest. Cams? Ron shook his head, eyes darting momentarily toward the corridor. Footage showed zilch. Everyone's gathering conference room. Henry yawned. Fuck, bro. What time is it? Four in the morning, Ron responded. With a heavy sigh, Henry mentally prepared himself. All right. Let's go. The two men left the room, navigating the mansion's dimly lit halls. Arriving at the conference room, they found the door slightly ajar, revealing a soft glow from within. Henry pushed it open, and the scene unfolded before him. Isaac was hunched over a portable tablet, tracing a path with his finger. Ryan stood next to him, pointing out specific spots on the screen, his brow furrowed in concentration. A cluster of Zulu-9 operators and Sanarin knights murmured amongst themselves, exchanging glances and sharing theories. More members continued to stream into the room, groggy-eyed but tense. Yen. Henry began, nodding in acknowledgement as he stepped inside. Report. Isaac looked up, holding out the tablet. The laser at the entrance was tripped. No staff over there. Ron leaned in, eyes squinting at the screen. Camera feeds? Ryan interjected before Isaac could answer. All up and running. But there's nothing out of the ordinary with them. We're reviewing the footage again to see if we missed something. There was a pause of stifling silence hanging in the air. The wait was broken by an unexpected quip from one of the Zulu Nines. Maybe it's a ghost, looking for some late night snacks? A few chuckles resonated through the room. Henry smirked but remained focused. Keep the jokes for later, he said, eyes still on the tablet. We need to. Another alert sounded, this one more pronounced. Head snapped toward the source. Ryan quickly tapped on the camera feed, magnifying the view of the Grand Hall. The doors to the Grand Hall were open, but there was no one present. Shit, do ghosts actually exist? Someone else asked. Henry's sharp eyes caught at first a barely discernible ripple in the air, reminiscent of heat waves on asphalt. Wait, he said, holding up a hand. He motioned to the screen. There. Replay that. Ryan quickly rewound the feed, 
playing back the last few seconds. The doors creaked open slightly, followed by the same ripple almost imperceptibly moving inside. The fuck? Isaac noticed the faint distortion. Legit ghosts? Active camo? Switch to infrared, Henry ordered, a gut feeling nudging him. Ryan raised an eyebrow. Infrared? You think it'll show up? Just a hunch, Henry said. With a tap, the screen's hues shifted. The grand hall was awash in blues and purples, with the occasional yellow of warmer objects. But next to the warm amber glow of the lantern, there was a distinct, cold silhouette. More silhouettes surrounded it, each varied in how well they blended with the background. Henry leaned in closer, his suspicion confirmed. Gotcha, he murmured. Ryan blinked, surprise evident. I'll be damned. The murmurs grew louder as the men in the room commented on the source of the intrusion. What the hell is that? Before Henry could voice his thoughts, Kelmuthus approached the screen. Catching sight of the evidence, his face tightened. That, he began voice low, is no mere phantasm. Tis the art of Nobian cloaking magic. A murmur of unease swept through the room. Isaac and Ryan exchanged a glance, their usual composed demeanor slipping just a tad. Henry picked up on it and held up a hand, bringing the room to a hush. The projection of the distortions on the screen, now with an explanation attached, seemed even more menacing. Henry nodded at Kelmethus, silently urging him to continue. In the lands of the Nobian Empire, there reside beasts called lurkers. They bear a talent to bend the very fabric of light around their form, rendering themselves nigh invisible to our sight. Henry recalled wildlife documentaries where animals like chameleons changed color to blend with their surroundings, but this seemed more advanced. Bending light? he interjected. Kelmuthus gave a solemn nod. Indeed. Much akin to how this device, he gestured to the infrared display, reveals the warmth of beings, not unlike the manner of reptiles in this realm. Tis whispered amongst our scholars that the Nobians, through ages of observance and study, might have gleaned secrets from these lurkers. With time and art, they might have harnessed such knowledge, fashioning spells to grant them comparable concealment. So they learned from those lurkers, Ron said. Kelmuthus replied, It is only what we surmise. Our knowledge of the Nobians is scant at best. They have long shielded their intents, often rebuffing our overtures for peace and kinship. Yet tales have trickled down hints and whispers. Henry crossed his arms. They had such little information to work with. How effective is their magic? Does it only bend the light? Kelmuthus shook his head. No, not merely so. It refracts it, disperses it. If wielded with mastery, it can render the caster near invisible, spanning diverse spectrums. Yet, his finger gestured to the screen where the distortion ambled past the warm light. It appears some among the Nobians lack finesse in all domains. Ryan smirked. So most of them are more familiar with making themselves invisible to the human eye, but a handful screwed up when it came to infrared. In essence, I, Kelmuthus affirmed. It appears this one erred in his art, neglecting to adjust when nearing the warm radiance. A fleeting misstep, but one that betrayed their presence. Henry breathed a sigh of relief. At least we know Nobian magic is still fallible. Kelmuthus nodded slowly, his eyes narrowing. All forms of art have their frailties, even the sophisticated spells of the Nobians. Yet, we must remember that full reliance on your devices might lead to deception. Isaac tilted his head. So you're suggesting we can't lean on our tech to spot these guys? The Archmage turned to face him. While your technologies are wonders in their own right, they might not always prevail against these arcane means. I would advise diversifying our approach. What do you propose then? Perry asked. Disrupting their illusions is of utmost importance. Kelmuthus explained. Our knights and mages have honed particular counters to dispel such magics. If timed right, these could momentarily fracture their cloak, rendering it ineffective or, at the very least, weaken it. Ryan raised an eyebrow. That sounds like a plan. 
So we'll work in tandem? I, the archmage confirmed. Your eyes are magic. Henry rubbed his eyes, his mind running through the implications. Let me get this straight. He started. You want to identify the intruders so you can cast your magic on them? How exactly will you disrupt their cloaking? Kelmethus swept his hand through the air, invoking a shimmer of translucent waves. Consider their cloaking magic as a ceaseless endeavor to weave into the tapestry of their surroundings. Should they walk past a tree, they must meld with it. Should they walk through a crowd, they must meld with the many faces and fabrics that make up the crowd. Our counters are purpose to fray that delicate weave. By flooding their sensory inputs, Henry guessed. Kelmethus nodded thoughtfully. Precisely. We deluge them with potent, ever-shifting magical currents, creating a tumult their illusions struggle to mirror. Our casting shall be unpredictable, shifting faster than the Nobians can adapt. Ryan frowned. But won't that tip him off? They don't know that we can see M. The moment they feel their cloak weakening, they'll realize we're on to M. Henry tilted his head. Ryan was right, to an extent. It might, but they probably won't notice right away. We can bait them into wasting more of their energy and attention. We don't need to unveil them right away, we can just tire them out. By the time they realize, it'll be too late. And once their guise falters, if even for a fleeting heartbeat, our knights shall spring forth. Their speed should make capture a trifling matter. Might want to knock him out ASAP, Ron commented. We brought a few tasers along with us. Flashbangs too. We can toss them to give the knights an easier time. Ryan nodded. Can't get answers out of a corpse. Henry felt a shiver as he heard Ryan's words, as if he spoke from first-hand experience. Knowing that Ryan and Isaac were dispatched from Langley, it didn't surprise him but it still sent a chill down his spine. This was a man truly not to be fucked with. Perry seemed to be impacted a bit more by Ryan's words. He held up his hands. Whoa, whoa, let's try not to end up with bodies here. Look, I get the stakes, and I know your team's priority is to ensure our safety. But if there's a chance, even a slim one, to detain one of these intruders peacefully, it could make a world of difference in understanding their intentions. Our actions tonight could dictate the trajectory of our future interactions with the Nobians. I certainly agree, Ambassador, but no promises, Ryan said. As the words left his mouth, a new silent alarm popped up. Isaac glanced down at his screen and then looked up. Kitchen adjacent to the Grand Hall, he announced, his tone tight. Henry's pulse spiked slightly. The intruders were getting deeper into the mansion. It wouldn't be long before they circled around and found the guest quarters upstairs. He gestured to Ron, Ryan, and Kelmethus. Owens on point. Hayes rear. Archmage, you're in the middle. Take two of your knights. Kelmethus assessed his knights, deciding who to bring along. Hail, W-Y-N-T. He nodded to two knights. Take up the flanks, Henry said. The two knights, both adorned in full plate armor, stepped forth and took their positions. Ryan adjusted the sling of his rifle, hand grazing an equipment pouch, while Ron gave Henry a brief acknowledging tilt of his head. Satisfied with his squad, Henry turned back to Isaac. Let me know if another point gets tripped. After checking comms, Isaac nodded. Understood, Captain. Set up a QRF with Weaver and pair them with some of the knights. Henry continued. He still didn't know how many intruders were inside the mansion. Three squads, including his own, would have to manage. I want five others with Weaver. Have them bring the mansion staff over here for safety. Once they're back, have them prepped in case there are more alarms or if we need backup. Everyone else stays behind in the conference room to protect the ambassador and his staff. On it, Isaac replied. Henry gave a curt nod. Good. He turned to his squad. Let's get to the kitchen. Keep it tight and silent. He felt confused by his own words, looking at the knights and their clinking armor. But as they left the conference room, he noticed that their movements emitted little sound. Magic or training? He shelved the thought, 
focusing on the hallway ahead. Drawing the goggles over his eyes, the HUD immediately lit up, presenting a crystal clear display. The shadows that previously veiled objects and corners were pushed back, the outlines of his teammates and surroundings highlighted in a subtle glow. Small blue icons floated above Ron and Ryan. Manual tagging, Henry muttered as he tapped a button on the side of his goggles. A soft chime acknowledged his command. Focusing his gaze on the knight's hail and W-I-N-T, he quickly spoke. Tag as friendly. Two new icons settled above the knights, joining the others. He then swiftly glanced at Kelmethus, who was already marked with a distinct circular icon different from the blue diamonds over everyone else that hinted at his magical prowess. Ron, just up ahead of Henry, signaled the all-clear as they approached the doors to the Grand Hall. Henry's earpiece crackled to life, Isaac's voice coming through. Grand Hall showing clear on cams, no visible threats. Proceed with caution. Copy, Yen. Going in. With that assurance, he signaled Ron to take point with the knights. He glanced at Hale, then pointed it as his large shield. The knight nodded, lifting it high in preparation. They positioned themselves on the left side of the door while Ryan, W-Y-N-T, and Kelmethus positioned themselves on the right side of the door. After a tap on the shoulder, Hale moved forward. The two knights stepped into the grand hall and immediately veered to their respective sides to clear the corners, shields providing an effective barrier. Henry raised his rifle, swiftly moving behind Ron and Hale. Infrared lasers swept across the room as his squad cleared it. Scanning, he found nothing but polished furniture and dimly flickering lights. Looking through the thermal view on his goggles, he found no distortions at all. Having cleared the entrance to the Grand Hall, the knights adjusted their shields and pushed toward a side door that led into the kitchen. Stack up, Henry murmured, indicating the kitchen's entrance. Repeating their breaching process, they swept the kitchen. The room was vast, the central magic stove casting an eerie glow. The immediate silence was disrupted only by the subtle clink of equipment and the subdued footfalls of the squad. Ron, after sweeping the left, signaled an all-clear. Ryan, having done the same on the right, mirrored the gesture. Henry's gaze was drawn to the stove, curiosity peaked. But as he studied the strange device, a ripple caught his eye. The colors on his goggles seemed to shift hues ever so slightly before disappearing into the background. Kitchen's clear, Ron whispered, but the tone of his voice held a question. It was the inflection Henry had come to recognize the one that meant, Do you see what I see? He merely nodded and adjusted the grip on his gun. A thought flashed across his mind. If the cloaking relied on manipulating light, could a focused beam disrupt it further? Without making it too obvious, he adjusted his rifle's angle, letting the laser on it sweep past the stove, almost as if he were scanning the general surroundings. The reaction was near instantaneous. Where the laser touched, the air quivered and revealed a faint thermal distortion. For a split second, the Nobian intruder's outline sharpened, the laser's concentrated beam throwing the cloaking magic off balance. It was as if the laser's intense, Singular beam was too precise and concentrated for the magic to refract seamlessly. Henry kept his face impassive, hiding his realization. Instead, he turned to Ron, using his eyes to indicate the position of the hidden figure. He then turned, his back facing the stove, and pointed at a bag of flour then subtly thumbed over his shoulder. Ron caught his eye movement and followed the subtle direction, giving a minute nod in response. Henry motioned for Ryan to move around to the far pantry, marking a point on his visor. Ryan nodded, hand brushing his equipment pouch as he moved discreetly, acting as if he were inspecting the surroundings. As he walked to the designated point, Henry turned to the Cenarans. He pointed to them, then to himself, follow me. Taking cover behind a shelf out of the Nobian's line of sight, he used swift gestures to demonstrate the necessary precautions to take against a flash bang. He pointed to his mouth, opening it slightly, then gestured for the Cenarans to do the same. The Cenarans watched, concentrating as they tried to grasp the significance of these unfamiliar gestures. Thankfully, Kalmathus was quick to catch on, 
imitating Henry's movements. Looking at the knights, Henry pointed to Kelmethus and himself. The knights realized his message, nodding and following suit. He gave them a thumbs up and a nod, internally relieved. He then signaled for them to stay put and keep low, holding a closed fist in the air. A subtle click resonated from the far pantry the sound of a safety pin being pulled. It was followed by the faint sound of metal skidding across the floor, and then a deafening pop that filled the kitchen. A-G-G-H! The intruder screamed, groaning in pain. Go! Go! Henry dropped his fist, reaching for a taser. As he turned the corner past the shelf, he saw Ron tossing a bag of flour over a clearer distortion that was visibly fumbling over the countertops. The fine white particles settled in the air and clung to the hidden Nobian, revealing a humanoid silhouette. Henry lunged forward, taser in hand. The electrified prongs found their mark on the man, sending jolts through his form. The intruder convulsed for a brief second, his magical cloak flickering off, before collapsing to the ground. Almost immediately, Hale and W.Y.N.T. sprinted forward. They threw themselves onto the Nobian intruder, pinning him firmly. Kelmethus then manipulated the stone floor, shifting it to wrap around the intruder's limbs. Ron and Ryan stepped forward, guns pointed at the man on the floor. Shit, Ron remarked. Can't believe that actually did the trick. Ryan moved swiftly, kneeling beside the unconscious Nobian and beginning a careful but efficient search of the man's person. Wish I had this shit in Tehran, Ryan muttered. Henry knelt down to help him out. His fingers brushed against the cold metal of a blade, hidden seamlessly within the folds of the operative's clothing. Extracting it and setting it aside, Henry's brow furrowed at the unfamiliar alloy it was composed of and the intricate symbols engraved on its hilt. Ryan, observing the blade, commented with a half-whistle. That's no souvenir shop find. Henry nodded, looking up to Kelmethus. Anything we should be worried about here? The archmage picked up the blade and inspected the symbols. The blade bears enchantments to enhance its durability. Moreover, it can serve as a conduit for weaving spells. Yet, fear not, it holds no snares or timed spells, if such are your concerns. Henry's attention turned to Ryan's voice. Mana crystal, he said, giving the object to Kelmethus for study. A crystal of lesser quality, nearing depletion, he commented. The fractures indicate a hasty rate of mana consumption. As Ryan pulled another set of blades hidden in the Nobian's boots, Henry felt the contours of a pendant around the man's neck. Removing it, he handed it to Kelmethus. An artifact? Indeed. Within, it houses a crystal of greater refinement, albeit this too is spent. I surmise its use was to bolster the art of concealment, but further study is required for a fuller understanding. Next, Henry produced a sealed vial, its contents a shimmering blue liquid. A basic mana potion, W.Y.N.T. offered. Henry nodded, pocketing it. Dr. Lamar and Dr. Perdue would certainly love to take a look at the substance. He finally reached the last of the man's pockets, retrieving a small, tightly rolled scroll and a quill. At a glance, it looked like any other piece of parchment, but given the context, it could be something more significant. Ron leaned in. Orders? Could be, Henry murmured, unfurling the scroll. It revealed writing, but none that Henry could understand. He turned to Kelmethus, offering him the scroll. Does the translation magic not work for writing? He took the scroll, analyzing its contents. Aye, it does. The circle of understanding works for both spoken word and scripture. The ones that I and my mages applied covered only the Sinaran tongue and Enish common. However, I can bestow upon you knowledge of other languages I am versed in. Yeah, please do, Henry said. Very well. The archmage summoned a handful of magic circles under Henry, Ron, and Ryan. Electricity once more crawled along Henry's skin. As the circles faded, Kelmethus returned the scroll to Henry. This time, the words seemed to click in his mind, rearranging to English. He read the contents of the scroll aloud. Unknown faction, large metal carriages stationed near entrance, 
likely same ones encountered during the ambush. Henry paused, looking up, then doing a double take on that line. It didn't change. It was definitive proof that the Nobians had something to do with the ambush. The fuck? Ryan took the words right out of his mouth. So these are the fuckers behind that. Kalmathus shrugged, a gesture he had learned from the Americans. It would seem my suspicions held true. He glanced at Henry. Please continue. No riders atop. Emit strange humming sound. Unknown purpose, likely some sort of siege mechanism. Strange warriors, not of Sanarin or known lands. Dark and sleek armor, unlike metal or leather. Movements suggest elite training. Faces shielded with glass that glows faintly. Wield not swords, but elongated instruments. Likely sane tools identified during the ambush that shot thunder without incantation. Not crossbow. Something more potent. Frequently converse with Sanarin Archmage of high standing. Possible alliance? The Archmage wears regalia likely identified as Kalmathus of House Helis. Accompanied by two Sanarin knights. Possible threat to the Empire. Strange boxes and panes affixed to their armor. One of the panes can emit light, like a scrying mirror. And it looks like he drew some sketches of what he saw. Damn, Ron muttered after Henry finished. Sounds like we made quite the impression. Henry nodded, considering the implications of the scroll. They had just been given a glimpse into how alien their presence must seem in this world. And this agent had taken note of everything. It's more intel for them on us than vice versa, Ryan said. We should get back to base. Henry concurred with a silent nod, stowing the scroll away. As he did so, a crackle in his earpiece broke the momentary silence. Isaac's voice came through. Citrep? Henry replied. One hostile detained. Searching for intel. What's your position? Another alarm, staff quarters. They're on the move. Count two Tango Oscar Mike en route to quarters. Copy. Henry's mind raced this complicated their situation. Status on Weaver? Isaac answered Henry's concern. They brought back the mansion staff. Safe and sound here. The quarters are a ghost town now. Solid copy. Henry's response was crisp. But his mind was already turning over the logistics of an evacuation. We need to consider pulling back to Armstrong. The mansion is compromised. Isaac responded. Understood. I'll brief Perry. Are we calling it? Yeah, notify Armstrong. Secure the ambassador, start prep for evac. I'm heading to the staff quarters first, but have transport on standby. Roger that. Henry turned to Kelmethus. The Nobian can you keep him under? The archmage gave a nod. With a few whispered incantations, he hovered his hands over the still figure's face, palms glowing as he cast his spell. He shall remain in slumber for another three hours. Hayes, W-Y-N-T, secure the Nobian in the conference room. Once you're done, meet us at the entrance to the staff quarters. The two men nodded, grabbing the intruder by the arms as they began to drag him out of the kitchen. Owens, hail on me. Archmage, stay in the middle. We're heading to the staff quarters. Ron and Hale fell into step beside him. They left the kitchen, moving slightly ahead of Ryan and W.Y.N.T. They transitioned from the grand hall to the mansion's entrance, carefully navigating up the stairs to the left until they found themselves at the entrance to the staff quarters. Weaver's status? Henry asked. En route, Isaac responded. Should be coming from the guest quarters in a few seconds. Copy. Henry's hand went up, and they paused outside the entrance. The doors were open the Nobians didn't even bother to close them. They knew they were exposed and had little time to escape. But if escape were so important, why detour to the bedrooms? They had to be searching for more intel. He could only hope that Roland's staff didn't leave behind any significant information on the delegation. The seconds ticked by quickly, Weaver's squad approaching with the soft shuffle of equipment. Hallways clear, Henry announced. Let's sweep. The knights in Weaver's squad joined Hale in the vanguard, 
moving forward with their shields raised. Henry's eyes swept the hallway a narrow artery of stone and shadows as Weaver's squad fell in behind Hale and advanced. As they approached the first bedroom door, he caught the eye of a knight from Weaver's squad and jerked his head toward the hallway. Without a word, the knight and two others peeled off, guarding the others while they stacked up on either side of the bedroom door. On my go, Henry whispered. The knights acknowledged. One to the left, another to the right, they braced. Henry counted down with his fingers. Three, two, one, and the knights breached. The door barely resisting, swung open to reveal the dim interior of the staff bedroom. The team flowed in behind the shields, swiftly checking the corners of the room. Kelmuthus moved in, shifting mana in the room randomly as he raised and lowered the temperature. A dresser drawer was ajar, its contents spilled like an afterthought. He swept his gun's laser over the room no thermal distortions. Henry's hand went to the open window, the night breeze cooling the room. He leaned out to check, no activity in the courtyard. Clear, Ron's voice was low but certain. No intruders, just the whisper of what was left behind or the aftermath of the hasty evacuation led by Weaver. Henry stepped back, his glance meeting Weaver's. Next room. They withdrew as one, the knights backing out last, shields still guarding the space they vacated. The men in the hallway held their positions, shifting forward as Henry's team stacked by the second door. They repeated the clearing procedure entry, sweep, cast, clear. He saw nothing but the residue of hurried departure. Then, as they regrouped, a sound a soft creak of wood echoed down the hall. They turned as one, just in time to see a door swing open. A subtle distortion entered the room, fainter than the cloak of the Nobian captured in the kitchen. An operative's voice cut through the earpiece. Contact! Henry's hand shot up, a silent command halting any forward motion. The operative's report of movement hung in the air, a taunt that tempted a rash response. But Henry's mind worked the angles, his focus narrowing. He knew better than to chase shadows not until every corner had been checked, every potential threat accounted for. Maintain position, he ordered. Confirm all rooms are secure. We're not splitting up or getting drawn out. Room by room, they swept through the remaining spaces each clearing yielding nothing but the echo of absence. Hayes and W.Y.N.T. returned, helping secure the last rooms. With the hallway now under their control, Henry gathered his original squad. You're with me. If this is a feint, we don't bite hard. He continued turning to face Weaver's squad. Weaver, hold here. Secure the area and keep comms clear. Anything moves, let us know ASAP. Henry's squad formed up, Hale and W.Y.N.T. with shields up front. The narrow corridor stretched out before them, magical light casting shadows on the carpet. They crept forward, Henry's eyes scanning the surroundings for any sign of thermal distortion. A sudden scuff from the open window to his left drew his attention, but there was nothing outside a simple trick of the acoustics, or perhaps a deliberate distraction. They moved on. They reached the door the threshold where the distortion had last been seen. The room was dark not a major concern for his goggles, but he could only imagine how the knights must have felt pushing into a pitch-black death trap like this. Once more, they stacked up against the door and cleared the room. The room was as empty and messy as the other's items from drawers and closets strewn about and an opened window. Clear, Henry announced, finding no distortions. The quiet was deceptive. All this build-up would it be for nothing? He walked up to the open window and looked out again. His eyes scanned the grounds beyond, searching for any disturbance in the landscape. There, garden beside the entrance, about one hundred meters out. His voice was barely audible as he gestured towards a line of shrubbery that swayed unnaturally as if someone brushed past it. Looks like they're retreating. W.Y.N.T.'s armor clanked subtly to his left as he approached the window. Shall we pursue, Captain? Henry simulated the scenarios. Pursuing now could lead them into a trap, or worse, away from the heart of the matter back inside the mansion. There was no good reason to pursue, and he doubted they could find the cloaked intruders easily in the dark expanse of the early morning. 
We circle back, he decided. Cordon and secure. Regroup and prep for immediate exfil. They withdrew from the window, retracing their steps. The team reversed out of the staff quarters, making their way back to the conference room without incident. Henry's mind was already turning over the necessary steps for evacuation as they entered the conference room. Inside, the captive from the kitchen lay bound and still unconscious on the floor. A few operatives worked on clearing out the myriad of electronics as Dr. Anderson stowed a group of scrolls and books into his bag texts on Nobian society. Isaac waved as Henry's team entered. Captain, Armstrong confirms our evac ETA on escort, five mics. Roger that. Owens, prep our exfil. I want the wraps warm and ready ASAP. Henry ordered. While Ron and a few other drivers darted away, Henry turned to Ryan. Hayes, take point on the prisoner transfer. Acknowledging the order, Hayes maneuvered towards the inert form of the Nobian, calling over WYNT to help drag the man out. As they did so, Roland walked up to Henry, presenting a deep bow. Pray, forgive us for failing to prevent this incursion. I have notified the night garrison of your evacuation via ethograph. They shall assist your convoy to the city limits. If there is anything else you require of us, do not hesitate to say the word. Henry half expected the man to initiate a cliched apologetic ramble in an attempt to save the face of Duke Vancer. Instead, the butler's response was direct, efficient, and above all, without bullshit. Henry appreciated that. Good work. For now, help us pack our stuff. At once, Captain. Wrapping up the evacuation procedures, a thought struck his mind. He frowned out of concern, approaching Perry. Ambassador, did you manage to reschedule the talks? Perry nodded a sight that granted Henry a sliver of relief. Yeah, he answered. Talks are deferred to next week. I'm hoping to relocate talks to Armstrong or Groom Lake as well. And the Duke? Henry probed further, tone anticipatory. If Duke Vancer agreed to relocate to Armstrong or Groom Lake, security would be a whole lot easier. Kalmathus will keep our dialogue with Roland and through him, the Duke ongoing via ethograph. Perry gestured toward the Archmage, who stood conversing with his knights. We'll know in a few hours at the earliest, or whenever the Duke wakes up. Henry looked to the side, glancing at Kalmathus and his knights. A week, huh? Will the delays impact our current agreements? Perry followed Henry's gaze. No. The Archmage and his men will continue to work with us, so we'll be able to continue gathering data and maintain their magical and tactical expertise one less thing to worry about, given the Nobian's newfound interest in our affairs. That was a relief. The Nobians already gave them enough trouble snooping around for intel. Good. Unexpected lessons in Nobian tactics should be a one and done. Everything's green on your end for Exfil? Perry double-checked his bags, ensuring all his diplomatic paperwork was secured. Yes, all set here. Just making sure nothing sensitive gets left behind. Henry shifted his focus, conducting a thorough final sweep of the room and his quarters. His eyes scanned methodically, searching for any misplaced equipment. The SOP was clear leave no trace and he intended to follow it to the letter. He grabbed the toothbrush and other toiletries from the restroom, stowing them in a bag. Not the most sensitive, but he understood Perry's and Anderson's concerns about cultural contamination. Zulu 9, status report. He called into his radio. Area sanitized, sir. All personal effects accounted for and gear recovered. One of his men answered. Copy that. Confirm with team leads, we're leaving now. Henry responded. He glanced around once more before approaching the stairway overlooking the main entrance. Perry was already there, leaning over the rails. The delegation's personnel streamed out the front door, maids and butlers helping carry some of the bags. A shame we couldn't get to stay. Perry sighed. Henry could imagine the man's disappointment historic first contact stunted by the wanton aggression of an unknown party. A shame indeed, Henry agreed. Let's go. They descended the staircase, noticing Roland waiting for them at the bottom. 
The distinguished attendants stepped forward as they reached the last step. Ambassador, Captain, it has been both duty and honor to attend to your needs within these walls, he said. I hope that our endeavors have risen to meet the unforeseen nature of your stay here. Perry extended his hand, a mutual respect reflected in his firm handshake. You've gone above and beyond, Roland. We won't forget the hospitality we've been shown, nor the cooperation. Roland nodded, his face as unreadable as ever. Henry couldn't say for certain, but he could sense the man's relief. For all he knew, he could have been legally executed in this country for such an oversight. The roads may be fraught with the perils of not only beasts but also with the whims of those who may seek to waylay your convoy. May your passage to your base be swift and blessed by the light of Sola. With a final nod, Henry and Perry joined the delegation's controlled exodus, exiting the mansion. Outside, the morning light began to paint the world in hues of gold and amber, not unlike the sunrises of Earth. The knights of the local garrison, now serving as the advance guard, had already begun clearing a path. Henry stepped out onto the mansion's porch, squinting slightly as his eyes adjusted. He saw the knights in formation, their glinting armor a stark contrast to the gear of his own men. Weaver, confirm our lead with the garrison. I want eyes on for advance sweep, he ordered, watching as Weaver nodded and relayed instructions. Perry joined him, the straps of his bag gripped tightly in his hand. Think the Nobians are still in the city? he asked. Henry opened the door to his MRAP, taking a seat beside Ron. Doubt it, but I can't say for sure. Man, I just hope we don't get off on the wrong foot. Perry rubbed his face as he sulked back in his seat. Ron rolled the car forward, leading the rest of the convoy out of the mansion's driveway. Might be too late for that, he said. Though Henry shared Perry's optimism, he knew that Ron's answer was the most probable. If the Nobians were interested in discourse, they wouldn't have infiltrated the mansion no cultural excuse could possibly cover for this, and even Dr. Anderson agreed. As the walls of the city faded behind them, he picked up his radio. Armstrong, this is Pioneer Lead. We have exited Elderlore. We are Oscar Mike, over. Chapter 5, Alpha Team Groom Lake, Nevada Area 51 November 17, 2024 As dawn cast a pale light over the Nevada desert, Henry's morning routine was abruptly interrupted. The familiar buzz from his communicator cut his breakfast short his briefing was in five minutes. He tapped the device clip to his belt, acknowledging the summons as he finished up the remnants of his French toast. He strode toward the Situation Room, taking in the changes that had taken place over the past week. Where once there had been the quiet hum of scientific exploration and data collection, there was now the rumble of construction and transportation. The pathway leading to the Shimmering Portal, previously traveled by scientists and a trickle of military personnel, had expanded into distinct incoming and outgoing lanes complemented by traffic lights. To the side of the hangar, massive construction vehicles queued, awaiting their turn to pass through the gateway. A paving machine, its form a silhouette against the portal's glow, inched forward until it was swallowed by the iridescent threshold. One by one, they disappeared into the portal, each carrying their part of the American initiative to Gera. A team of technicians surrounded the incoming lane, clearing it out and sounding a buzzer to mark the lane's temporary transition to a second outgoing lane. Henry caught sight of a pair of Apaches approaching the lane. Secured on large flatbeds, the helicopters would soon find their new home at Armstrong Base. As Henry picked his way between the stacks of cargo and clusters of personnel, Ron caught up to him with a less than enthusiastic shuffle. Morning wake-up calls just keep getting earlier. What's the bet this is another strategic urgency spiel? He yawned, the dim hangar lighting casting a tired shadow over his face. Henry offered a wry smile. He knew exactly what could get the man excited. Pause. Well, if they're pushing us to gear up for Gera, I'm all for sacrificing sleep. Beats staring at the sagebrush art around here. He quipped. Ron snorted, his stride upright with new life. She it. I'd trade in my figurines to get back there. Beats the hell out of this metal maze. 
They approached a staircase beside the gateway, walking up to the control room. Bruh, you just want a front row seat to see if Kelmethus was speaking facts about elves. Henry teased, elbowing Ron lightly. Ron flashed a conspiratorial grin. Hey, a little recon on local. Wildlife never hurt. Nah, but for real though, you think we're rolling out soon? Henry paused at the top of the stairway and considered the flurry of activity around them. Hard to say, but with all this, he gestured at the preparations around them. Plus the talks coming up, I'd say we're not just here to play war games. He continued walking, boots studding against the metal grating as he and Ron approached the control room. Inside the glass-paneled room, Director Lombard and Dr. Lamar were engrossed in their work. Snippets of their conversation about the Garen Gateway and something about an analysis of Kalmuthus magic flowed out of the open doorway. They must have enjoyed Kalmuthus lectures on magic far more than he did. They moved past the control room, stepping into the quieter corridor that led to the situation room. Reaching the door, Henry pushed it open and stepped inside, ready to pivot from the what-ifs to the what-nows. Scanning the room, Henry saw familiar faces. Hayes having a conversation with Ambassador Perry, Yen on his laptop, and Dr. Anderson on a tablet reading a PDF scan of a book from the guest mansion's library. They all looked up at Henry's and Ron's entrance, sending acknowledging nods their way. As Henry took a seat with Ron, he glanced at Ambassador Perry, then back to the others. Another diplomatic security mission? Henry's gaze drifted momentarily to the window, watching as the technicians restored the incoming lane. He turned his attention back to the room just as the door swung open again, revealing General Harding. The chatter subsided instantly, Henry and the other operatives saluting him. At ease, Harding said, holding up a hand. As everyone returned to their seats, he began. Today, we're adapting to a new operational landscape. The events at Elderlore have expedited the need for a specialized unit. This will be a first for us a hybrid team with a very specific mandate. Henry leaned forward, elbows on the table and fingers interlaced. It looked like this might be something more exciting than just a diplomatic security mission. Captain Doniger, Lieutenant Owens, Mr. Hayes, Mr. Yen, and Dr. Anderson. You've been selected based on your service records, your skills, and your recent experiences on Gera. You will comprise a new unit, designated as Alpha Team. Harding then turned to face Henry. Captain Doniger, you command Alpha Team. Your actions in Elder Lore showed initiative and adaptability traits we need for what lies ahead. Henry accepted the appointment with a nod. Alpha Team will be embedded into local societies, operating with self-sufficiency and within a few hundred miles of Armstrong Base. Your diverse skill sets should cover everything you may need with Dr. Anderson additionally overseeing interpretation and relations. Harding took a moment to survey the room, ensuring he had everyone's attention before he delved deeper into their mission parameters. Alpha Team's primary objective is intelligence hard intel on Gara's political factions, military capabilities, the capabilities of magic and local fauna, and any other players on the board. Establishing relations will be just as crucial. The more rapport you can build, the more we can know about and the better we can defend against possible threats. He paused. Your secondary objective is to safeguard U.S. interests in the region. Armstrong Base is our foothold in Gera, and we need to be ready to act against any threats that may arise. To that end, your immediate assignment is to integrate yourselves within the fabric of Elderlore. He clasped his hands behind his back, continuing. Alpha Team will head to the Adventurers Guild there. You're to register as adventurers. This guise will provide you with the necessary cover to operate freely and gather intelligence on the ground. This approach is unconventional, but it will grant you access to resources, information, and contacts that would otherwise be out of reach. The quests will give you a means of obtaining funds to sustain yourselves, as well as materials and artifacts that you will be sending back to Armstrong for analysis. Henry glanced at Ron. Here it was, the adventure Ron always spoke of, and the man was damn near unable to contain his glee. Even Isaac seemed to be excited. Honestly, he was actually looking forward to seeing what Ron was so excited about. 
his eyes moved back to the general as he continued. It is imperative that you blend in, learn the lay of the land, and establish a network within the adventurer community. According to Sir Adhelis, the various guilds are all international entities all with vast information networks. How you navigate these initial steps will set the stage for all our subsequent operations. Perry stood up then. He distributed a packet to each member mission dossiers filled with the current intel and preliminary assessments. Harding gave a nod of approval. Those packets have also been uploaded to your tablets and contain everything we know so far and highlight what we need to find out. Study them. Know them. They will be the foundation of your strategy. Henry flipped open his dossier, his eyes quickly scanning the contents. The maps were expanded from a basic view of the base's immediate surroundings to a complex analysis encompassing the entirety of the Grendon Plains. Shaded areas denoted territorial claims while stars marked settlements within a hundred miles of the base. Sketches and scanned paintings of various fauna stared back at him, accompanied by detailed profiles authored by Kelmethus and other Sonaran liaisons. As he absorbed the information, Harding continued, the prisoners' cooperation has been enlightening, though not without its challenges. Corroborating his intel is difficult given our limited presence on Gera, but we've verified enough to act upon thanks to our enhanced interrogation of the captured bandits and details from the Sonarans. Henry's focus sharpened as Harding laid out the verifiable basics. The Nobian Empire is on high alert. They're probing into our sudden appearance on the Grendon Plains and our intentions. Their first contact was aggressive it's a clear indication that they're not just curious. They may perceive any alliance we form as a direct challenge to their dominance in the region. Henry leaned back, taking a breath. He recalled the prejudicial view that the Cenarans and Eldralore had on the supposedly warmongering and devious Nobian Empire. Perhaps they weren't prejudiced at all. Harding turned, giving the floor to Ambassador Perry. The prisoners' insights give us a unique diplomatic advantage. We must be cautious, strategic, when it comes to who we talk to and how we affect the local societies. Ideally, we refrain from letting the Nobians think we're upsetting the geopolitical status quo. It's inevitable you will run into Nobian scouts, merchants, or plain travelers. Our interactions with them will set the tone for future engagements. It's imperative we do not close any doors diplomatic channels must remain open, even if they seem unresponsive to our overtures. Perry's eyes met Henry's. Alpha team will be our eyes and ears on the ground. How you engage with the Nobians, should the need arise, will either build bridges or burn them. After the ambush and the incident in Eldralore, it may seem like the bridge has already been burned but there remains the possibility that those actions were not sanctioned by the official Nobian government. Until we can find out more, remember that your actions not only reflect our military might but the diplomatic intentions of the United States. As Ambassador Perry concluded his guidance, General Harding stood once more. No questions? Upon seeing the shaking of heads, he continued. Excellent. You've got your orders. Gear up, study your dossiers, and be ready to move out within the hour. Dismissed. Henry and the rest of Alpha Team made their way to the exit. As the Situation Room door closed with a soft click, Harding's side barely filled the silence. Less than an hour till Duke Vance is supposed to arrive. He mused. Perry didn't look up as he stacked his briefing materials. Nervous? He asked, the question coming off as more of an observation than an inquiry. Harding shrugged. Lord knows. I always wondered how it would be if the Manifest Project ever succeeded. And here we are, Perry said, finishing Harding's thoughts. Harding waited for Perry at the door as he finished gathering papers into a binder. Yup. Feels different, now that we're actually here. Stepping out of the Situation Room. They began walking down the stairs toward the gateway. There's a certain clarity in moments like these, Perry offered. The future is ours to shape. It's a heavy mantle, but we carry it well. Clarity, sure, Harding grunted. But it's the unpredictable elements that keep me alert. They walked alongside trundling vehicles on a smaller path within the outgoing lane reserved exclusively for foot traffic. 
Stepping through into Armstrong Base, they were greeted by the lush greenery of the Grendon Plains and a pleasant early sunrise. Feeling the cool, crisp breeze, they paused to admire the scene. Perry's voice spoke the brief reverie. And that's precisely what we need, General. Director Lombard, myself, and many others we've all got a childlike optimism for this. You're our anchor. General Harding watched the landscape of Armstrong Base. It thrummed with the bustle of machinery, straddling the line between old certainties and new horizons. New structures had sprung up over the past week barracks, warehouses, garages, hangars, and the foundations for heavier infrastructure like radar. Hesco blocks and concrete T-walls created a perimeter around the base. To the right of the gateway, the skeleton of a future runway stretched out like the promise of tomorrow. He wondered how Duke Vansu would react to all this, then shook off the thought. That was Ambassador Perry's job. I suppose so, Ambassador. I suppose so. He checked his watch. We should move to the rendezvous point. The Sinaran delegation will be here in less than fifteen minutes. Ambassador Perry stretched his arm out. After you, General. They made their way toward the gateway's security checkpoint. Harding looked around the area, noting the positions of his men. They didn't have a red carpet, but they were certainly ready to receive the Sinarans. As they approached, he gave a subtle nod to a technician near the gateway. Commence gateway hold, the technician broadcasted. Secure all ingress and egress at the gateway. Roger, gateway hold is in effect, confirmed a watch officer from the nearby control booth. The familiar hustle around the portal ceased with immediate effect, traffic being redirected to make way for the delegation. Harding tracked the road that snaked towards Armstrong Base. The morning air was clear, save for the distant dust clouds stirred up by the approaching Sanarian delegation. Next to him, Ambassador Perry adjusted his binder, eyes lifting occasionally to the horizon. They both watched as the Sanarin procession appeared over the rise, the dratics and carriages emerging into view and escorted by a subtle vanguard of EGVs. The beat of hooves and the rumble of engines grew steadily louder, the American escorts maintaining a respectful distance. The procession approached, the dratics' reptilian nays adding a unique undertone to the morning calm. As the delegates reached the staging area, the EGVs peeled off, their task complete. The Sanarin convoy halted in front of them, guards and diplomatic staff dismounting from carriages while Dradak mounted and horse-mounted knights stood watch. Duke Vansa descended from his carriage, the morning light catching on the polished silvery metal of his breastplate. He swept aside his cloak, revealing intricate, flowery filigrees decorating his armor. The Duke's gaze swept the area calculated, lingering survey that took in the armed guards the nascent alien structures of Armstrong Base, and the mysterious mechanical constructs that hammered the earth in the background. Perry approached him. Your Grace, Duke Vanser Adstein, I am Ambassador John Perry, representing the United States of America, he said, extending his hand. We are honored by your historic visit and look forward to embarking on this journey of mutual understanding together. Duke Vanser studied the ambassador for a moment eyes darting from his suit's lapels to the blue tie and the American flag pin before finally meeting his eyes. He shook his hand, responding with a slight, acknowledging smile. Ambassador Perry, I extend to you the greetings of Sonara. Your amicable welcome is received in the spirit it is given. I am eager to partake in dialogue that shall illuminate the path for both our civilizations. General Harding then stepped forward. And I am General Alexander Harding the commanding officer of this installation. My role here is to ensure the security of these talks and to address any military concerns that may arise during our discussions. The Duke's response was equally direct, a nod to the simplicity of military candor. General, he said, shaking his hand, your charge is well received and respected. The sanctity and security of these proceedings are of equal import to us. We, too, wish for a discourse that will proceed unhindered and yield fortuitous outcomes for all. Following the initial introductions, Perry gestured towards the looming portal. Your Grace, if you would accompany us, we have prepared a place for more comfortable discussions at our facility. Duke Vanser, 
casting a final glance back at his retinue, signaled his readiness. Lead on, Ambassador. As they drew nearer, the subtle buzz of the portal's energy filled the air. Perry, walking beside the Duke, offered a courteous smile. I must express our gratitude for the hospitality your steward Roland extended at the guest mansion. It's a rare comfort to find such welcoming grace in foreign lands. A courtesy due to esteemed guests, Vansa replied, subtly lowering his head. I only regret that the peace of your stay was marred by those Nobian curs. Measures have been taken to fortify our hospitality against further intrusion. They stood before the portal, its surface a swirling dance of light and shadow. Duke Vansa hesitated, eyeing the phenomenon. Perry offered a reassuring smile. It's quite the experience, Your Grace. You may feel a slight frosty chill and a bit of nausea as we pass through, but it's a brief sensation. Harding could sense the man's resolve as he faced the unknown. If he felt trepidation, he hid it well. The Duke drew a breath, stealing himself. A chill, you say? A small discomfort for the promise of progress, he said and stepped forward his posture resolute as he disappeared into the portal's embrace. Harding followed after Perry, navigating the disorienting kaleidoscope of folding space-time with familiarity. Stepping off the gateway platform, Duke Vancer's composure was briefly undone by the experience and the sight that greeted them. The vastness of the facility opened up around them, a cavernous space bustling with activity. Barriers and security personnel formed a clear path, while off to the sides, scientific equipment blinked and hummed. Beyond, the shapes of construction vehicles and stacked materials stood idle, waiting for the gateway hold protocol to be lifted. A remarkable establishment, the Duke muttered, his eyes tracing the orderly lines of cargo awaiting transport to Armstrong Base. Harding noted the Duke's reaction. It's a constant effort. With the threat of dangerous fauna and now the Nobians, we've had to expand security further. As they walked, the Cenarans were softly exclaiming and pointing to things like tourists. These machinations, one of the aides murmured. They are unlike anything in our forges. Ambassador Perry glanced back with a practiced smile. The fruits of innovation and necessity. We'll discuss more as we proceed. Harding and Perry led them through the facility, making their way to the briefing room upstairs. The Cenarians moved tightly together, eyes stuck on the nearby security personnel and their strange staves. The efforts of Director Lombard and Dr. Lamar in the control room were viewed with much confusion as the Cenarians struggled to wrap their heads around the displays present. As they entered the briefing room, they exchanged pleasantries with some of the ambassador's aides. Perry gestured to the seating. Please, make yourselves comfortable. Duke Vansett took a seat the rest of his delegation following suit. His eyes briefly closed before reopening. Reflection? Adjustment? Harding wondered what it could be. General Ambassador, the Duke began. I am prepared for the proceedings to begin. Perry took the lead. Very well, Your Grace. Let us then address the immediate concerns that have precipitated these talks. Harding observed the assembly in silence as the discussion unfolded. The Duke seemed to shift his body slightly at those words. They were starting off strong, and there was no doubt the Duke had prepared for this. Though, was there anything the Duke could do to get ahead after such an embarrassment to Cenarin's security? Perry continued. First the incident involving the bandit ambush, confirmed as a Nobian act, as well as the Nobian intrusion that compromised the guest mansion's security and forced an evacuation. These unfortunate incidents that have precipitated this meeting are symptomatic of larger threats that could be preemptively addressed through our collaboration. Duke Vanser remained silent and composed, yet his attempt at masking his expressions was betrayed by a furrow of his brow. Indeed, those incidents are regrettable. I am listening, Ambassador. We would like to propose an arrangement where the Sonaran Federation and the United States cooperate to better prepare ourselves against further incursions. Perry suggested. In the spirit of mutual benefit, we would value an open exchange of information. Your insights into the regional dynamics, and particularly, the role of magic, would greatly enhance our understanding and operational readiness on Gera and in doing so, 
minimize security breaches. An exchange of information for the boon of security, he mused. This is a matter I shall bring before our High Council. Your aerial scouts, he said, glancing at a finely detailed printed map of the Grendon Plains, would present a compelling argument for the merits of such an exchange. Harding raised an eyebrow. The Duke was astute. He heard of the existence of Cenarin aerial assets like Griffin or Wyver Knights, but they couldn't hope to match the precision of their machines. He could see it in the Duke's eyes. This was the perfect tool for the ruler of a fortress city at the edge of Cenarin territory. Indeed, Your Grace, Harding interjected with a nod. The more information we know, the more we can mutually benefit from this exchange. Vance's posture relaxed marginally, the stiffness of his figure easing away. This is a proposal of significant weight. It is a matter that demands careful deliberation, yet the virtues it may yield beckon our attention. Let us proceed with outlining what this cooperation might entail, with the understanding that any agreement will be subject to the approval of our High Council. Harding allowed a pause to settle before outlining the terms that his and Perry's superiors worked on. The United States is prepared to provide the Sonaran Federation with advanced aerial surveillance. This includes real-time feeds and detailed mapping of potential threats, particularly along your borders, he said, gesturing to a screen with a drone feed to highlight his point. This surveillance will be conducted around Armstrong Base, focusing on the neutral territory of the Grendon Plains. We'll inform you of any sign of hostile activity from Fauna or the Nobians. Duke Vansa listened intently. What do you seek in return for this surveillance? Perry answered. In return, we would seek access to your repositories of knowledge libraries, institutions, and the like particularly those pertaining to magic. Our interest lies in understanding its principles, both for its cultural significance and potential practical applications. Harding watched the Duke closely, gauging his reaction. The Duke steepled his fingers, putting on a convincing poker face. Your request is substantial for our repositories of arcane knowledge are the sanctuaries of our history and wisdom. Nevertheless, the lure of safeguarding our realms with such foresight cannot be easily dismissed. I shall lay this matter before our High Council. Perry pulled out some papers from his binder. Of course, Your Grace. We can provide a detailed written proposal for you to take to them. Very well, Vansa agreed, accepting the papers. I shall review these preliminary terms with my advisors later. If all is well, I shall ensure they are given due consideration by the High Council. One deal hopefully down, another to go. Harding watched as Perry transitioned to the next topic on their agenda. Moving on to the subjects of culture and economy, I was informed about the existence of guilds. How do they work? Eldralore, Cenarin Federation November 17th 2024. Guilds stand as the pillars of our society, orchestrating the harmonious blend of skills, knowledge, and commerce. Kelmuthus explained. Each guild, sovereign within its sphere, upholds standards, nurtures talents, and contributes to the common wheel. Henry leaned against a nearby column as Kelmuthus talked. The plaza around them felt as busy as Times Square, but with fantastical diversity. A trio of adventurers passed them, Hauling bloodied leather bags no doubt confirmation of whatever mission they just completed as they walked inside to claim their rewards. They walked by a line directly in front of the guild's entrance, which consisted of young, eager-looking recruits. Many looked his age or younger, with some looking like they would have barely been in high school. The building itself towered above the plaza but was no taller or shorter than the other guild branches around them. They encompassed broad professions, from the Artisans' Guild to the Magic and Commerce Guilds. Banners in myriad colors representing various factions within the guilds fluttered in the breeze alongside starry Cenarin flags and flags of House Edstein. At the center of the plaza stood the statue of a woman, the goddess Sola. Ron gave a short whistle, a smile conveying his excitement, as clear as day. So this is the place you were talking about last week. Indeed. Of these guilds, the Adventurers' Guild, where we now find ourselves, is of particular import. Kelmuthus continued. I recall the file on the guilds, Yen said. 
structured systems for what would otherwise be freelancers. Indeed so, Mr. Yen, Kelmuthus replied. The Adventurer's Guild provides structure, resources, and a code of conduct. These tenets ensure that the endeavors of our adventurers are well-directed and harmonious with the greater good. Dr. Anderson seemed almost as excited as Ron but for a different reason. It's truly fascinating how these guilds and their branches are able to collaborate over such vast distances. The level of bureaucracy and organization involved is quite advanced for this era. I dare say, Dr. Anderson, your scholarly inclinations would find the intricacies of the Guild Council's workings quite enthralling. Kelmuthus teased the man. Dr. Anderson sighed. Checking out their headquarters in the Arthi continent would be a dream. I just hope I get the chance to visit the local headquarters in Sonara. Henry looked as another group of adventurers entered the building. So, what exactly should we expect for our registration? Come, let us venture forth to procure the necessary forms. I shall explain the registration process along the way, Kelmuthus declared, gesturing toward the guild entrance with a flourish of his hand. As Kelmuthus and Alpha Team entered the Adventurers' Guild, a hush fell over the nearby adventurers. Pointed fingers, surprised gasps, giddy fangirls. Henry didn't expect it, but it turns out Kelmuthus was famous. Walking up to the counter, he leaned against it and observed the mixed reactions around them. The young clerk at the registration desk looked up, her eyes widening slightly. Master Kelmuthus, what an honor to have you here! The archmage gestured toward Alpha Team. My companions seek to join as adventurers. I vouch for them and stand as their patron. The clerk quickly gathered several forms, sliding them across the counter along with a set of quills. For the registration, kindly mark down your names, where ye come from, what skills or experiences ye bring, and the like. Right here. She gestured towards the bottom of the form. You'll need to promise to uphold the guild's ways and rules. Henry picked up a quill, eyes scanning the parchment registration form. It was comprehensive, divided into several sections with each requiring thoughtful responses. The first was straightforward, asking for basic personal information, name, place of origin, age, education. He quickly jotted down. Henry Doniger, United States, 24, U.S. Space Force Academy. Next came a section on combat training and magical knowledge. He checked off his proficiency in hand-to-hand -hand combat, but there was no box for firearms or marksmanship. Archery would have to do. Beside him, Ron did the same, though he paused at the section on magic. Well, I've seen magic, does that count? He joked quietly. Henry smiled. Put down observer, that should cover it. The form then delved into past adventuring experiences. Henry glanced at his colleagues. Their time in Gera was their first real adventure in a traditional sense, but their military background was filled with experiences that felt relevant. He decided to summarize it as extensive military operations in varied environments, including their success against the bandit ambush and the capture of a Nobian intruder, as examples. The next section was about preferred roles. A list of options was given, archer-slash-ranged, frontline-slash-melee, support-slash-healer, and others. He circled archer-slash-ranged, but was stumped with what to put in the description underneath. If Kalmathus was familiar with dwarven arquebuses, then surely the Adventurer's Guild would also be familiar with the concept of firearms? Eh, hopefully it won't be an issue. Filling out the section, he moved on to the next. Quest preferences was the most intriguing part. The form listed various types of quests from monster hunting to diplomatic missions, rescue operations, and even more mundane tasks like herb gathering or escort services. Ron looked over. Do we select all? Henry thought about it. Might as well. We're here to gather intel, and even an herb gathering mission could result in some good material for Dr. Purdue. The final section was a declaration section, a solemn vow to uphold the Guild's code of conduct and adhere to several articles on adventuring ethics, international amity, and client confidentiality all written in a simplified, proto-legalese. Henry looked to his right. 
As expected, seeing such a document put an excited smile on Dr. Anderson's face. The document concluded with a formal attestation. In setting my signature hereunto, I, Henry Doniger, do hereby bind myself to these tenets and duties, fully cognizant of the weight they carry and the ramifications of their neglect. After reading the articles, Henry signed his name at the bottom and submitted the form. The clerk nodded approvingly as she collected the papers. Well then, your registration is nearly done. Now you'll be going through trials to see where you stand in the ranks and what sort of quests you'll be fit for. Henry exchanged a look with his team. Tests, huh? Sounds like we're back at the academy. Let's see what they've got for us. The clerk gave a friendly smile, gesturing towards a large doorway behind the counter. You'll be going through that door there and begin with the written tests. Best of fortune to ye, and welcome to the Adventurer's Guild. The trials you face hence are not merely assessments of skill but gateways to deeper understanding and greater feats. Duty calls me to confer with Captain Orlin regarding our recent tribulations, so I shall return later, after you have obtained your adventurer cards. As you may say, good luck. Henry led his colleagues through the large door, which opened into a hallway lined with banners depicting various beasts and heraldic symbols. A sign was placed next to the first door on their right that's where they would be taking the written tests. Entering the room, they were met with rows of desks and a handful of budding adventurers who were already seated. Some of the adventurers were clearly new, teenagers fidgeting with their quills as they waited for the proctor to arrive. Others were already a few months into their journey, hoping a good score would bump them up from Tier 4 to Tier 5 in trepidation for the advanced tests past Tier 5. Their conversations fell silent as they took in the arrival of Alpha Team. As Henry's team found their seats, a young elven woman at a nearby desk glanced over. Dressed in a green cloak and flexible armor that seemed to have both a silvery and golden sheen, the woman brushed her light blonde, almost silvery hair aside as she looked Henry up and down. You certainly stand out, she remarked. I'm Seraphine Adcindes, Tier 7. And who might you be? Henry found himself mesmerized by the woman's purple eyes, a biological anomaly that turned out to be rather alluring. He extended his hand. Captain Henry Doniger. We are not from around here. Seraphine looked at Henry's outstretched hand, waiting as if to intentionally make Henry uncomfortable and awkward before accepting it. Oh, that had escaped my notice, she said, analyzing their gear. Most entrants begin with naught but a simple tunic and blade, not garb as unusual as yours. A bold choice for neophytes. It worked well enough against those bandits last week, Ron muttered with a hint of defensiveness. Ah, uh, so it was your quaint troop that quelled that skirmish? You've proven yourselves in a scuffle with common brigands then. Her voice held a tinge of respect, but also an undertone suggesting that she considered the bandits to be a lesser challenge. An impressive feat for newcomers, indeed. Yet, the path of an adventurer is strewn with far greater perils than mere bandits. It shall be intriguing to see how your unique methods fare against more formidable adversaries. Her gaze lingered on them for a moment longer before she turned her attention back to her desk. Before more could be said, the guild proctor arrived and brought the room to order. Your inaugural trial shall be of written form, the older lady announced. It shall encompass the breadth of knowledge requisite for adventuring the perils, the lore, and the sagacity needed to navigate them. Two hours shall be allotted for this test. Begin. Henry thought he'd be done with academic challenges after graduating, but he had to admit, this was pretty interesting. Guess it's time to see how much of that briefing material stuck, he thought to himself. The test was meticulously structured, beginning with an in-depth exploration of monster tears and physiology. Intricate illustrations of creatures filled the pages from the common goblins to the elusive and dangerous death knight. Henry leaned in, scrutinizing each drawing, recalling briefing notes and cross-referencing them with the creature's characteristics before naming and categorizing them into their respective tiers. The lesser and greater variants and other subcategories thereof were a bit harder to pin down, but he could guess their general ranking amidst the other creatures. Overall, 
It was a much smoother experience compared to his high school days of identifying the mitochondria and other structures on a blurry, ink-splattered, and grainy figure of a cell. The next section presented a series of mathematical challenges centered around the economics of adventuring. Here, the questions were grounded in reality, calculating equipment repair costs, material profits, and expedition budgeting. One problem, in particular, stood out to Henry. It read, A shattered sword requires 1,500 lumens for repair. If a Sanaran merchant offers to pay for the repair in the local currency, how many sonars should Henry expect to receive? According to Kelmethus, the exchange rate between lumens and sonars was about 1 to 4. He flipped the page, checking a table to make sure. Yup, that would be 6,000 sonars. The section continued with similar problems ranging from the Griffin Feather Arbitrage in different cities to quest fees and taxation. Thankfully, the questions were nothing compared to the complexities of higher-order differential equations. A turn of the page brought them to the world of alchemy. The section was filled with detailed descriptions of potions, each characterized by its unique color, scent, and effects. They demanded careful analysis, challenging Henry's understanding of this arcane science. One of the questions posed a complex scenario. If combining two parts of moonshade extract with one part of sunleaf sap creates a potion for enhanced night vision, what would be the result of reversing the proportions? Discuss an application for this new potion. This type of question tested not only the basic knowledge of potion effects but also the principles of alchemical reactions, akin to stichiometry. Honestly, Henry didn't know the answer to that question but he could make an educated guess. If the original potion's dominant ingredient was moonshade extract it relates to night vision, then sunleaf sap, by contrast, might be associated with daylight-related effects. Thinking of practical applications, the new potion could probably reduce the intensity of light, allowing the user to see in blinding conditions, like if a dragon attacked from the direction of the sun. Henry wrote down his answer taking his time and thinking through the problems. Some scenarios he could deduce, others he had to recall from the dossier. The test even delved into basic aspects of crafting potions, particularly for injury recovery or other applications relevant to adventuring. In another instance, the test asked, Calculate the volume of solarian oil needed to neutralize the acidic properties of a large vial of viridian venom. Interestingly enough, the guild seemed to have a standardized system of measurement similar to the metric system. If not for the provided tables and ratios, he would have certainly struggled to answer these questions. He also made a mental note to get this crucial data uploaded, if it wasn't already. The final segment of the test plunged them into the realm of strategy and tactics. Here, hypothetical scenarios sprawled across the pages, orchestrating an ambush on a bandit encampment planning a defensive strategy against a marauding dragon, or coordinating a team for a dungeon delve. Each scenario provided its own description of available resources and terrain. Though he was more familiar with modern combat and tactics, he had studied and understood Kelmuth's dossier well. His quill moved confidently, drawing from his own experience to craft unique strategies that made the most of each scenario's available resources. As the time concluded, the proctor's voice cut through the room's concentrated silence. The allotted time has elapsed. Let your quills rest and cease all endeavors forthwith. Henry set down his quill, leaning back in his chair with a deep breath. He scanned the room, observing his team's reactions. Dr. Anderson, in particular, seemed unfazed, almost at ease. Made sense. Academic tests wouldn't be much of an issue for an academic. After collecting the tests and stacking them on her desk, the proctor addressed the room with a firm yet encouraging tone. Make your way to the training hall for the ensuing segment of your evaluation the trials of physical prowess. These shall gauge your readiness to face the myriad trials and tribulations that lie in the path of a true adventurer. The room stirred into motion. Sarah was already on her feet, a certain smugness in her behavior suggesting overwhelming confidence in her abilities. She caught Henry's eyes and offered a small, knowing smile. There's more to the path of an adventurer than mere words, she said. 
the true test begins now. For in the training hall, we shall see the metal not just of mind, but of body and spirit. Ron nudged Henry as Sarah strode ahead, rushing to meet her next challenge. She's bad as fuck bro. And she's got an attitude. Henry smirked, watching Sarah's retreating figure. Yeah, she certainly is a baddie. I dunno, I kinda like it. Reminds me of Dr. Lamar a bit skilled, confident, not afraid to speak her mind. Y'all thinking about mingling with the locals already, huh? Ryan joined in. Can't say I blame ya. Hopefully, the options here are less limited than in Tehran. Ron snickered. Watch the elves be super modest. I'm chilling though, chances are the cat girls and bunny girls will be down to mingle, you know, cause of biology. Henry looked at Ron. Bruh. Cat girls and bunny girls, huh? Isaac turned to Ron, a grin growing on his face. My man, he said, dapping him up. The other test takers around them raised a few eyebrows at the conversation, but Henry could see the growing smiles on their faces. Seems like this type of banter was a universal constant among young people, no matter the setting. They entered the training hall, a vast space filled with the sounds of clanging metal, muffled thuds, and occasional cheers. The hall was segmented into various areas, each designated for different roles. Henry led his team towards the range section, where targets of varying distances and sizes were set up. From the corner of his eye, he spotted Sarah already waiting for her proctor at a section marked for magic swordsmen. They waited alongside a few archers who cast curious glances at their attire and gear. After a few minutes, the proctor overseeing the range section walked up. Clad in a functional tunic that failed to contain his bulging muscles and holding a massive longbow engraved with runes, he addressed them. Stand to archers! He barked in a voice that reflected a military background. I am Taldron Advorn, Tier 9. I will oversee the range test today, and I expect each of you to demonstrate your prowess with keen eyes and steady hands. The other adventurers quivered upon seeing the man. Meekly, they abandoned hope of being graded positively by Dragon Eye Taldron. But the archer didn't pay heed to the amateurs wedding themselves. Instead, he found interest in Henry and Alpha Team. Now, where might your bows be? These contraptions you bear resemble no bow I've seen. Henry stepped forward, rifle in hand. These are our ranged weapons. They're called rifles, and they serve the same purpose as a crossbow, albeit with a different mechanism. The proctor eyes the rifles for a moment longer, his expression one of bemused curiosity. Rifles, you say? A queer sort of contraption, but the rules state any ranged weapon is permissible. He paused, then nodded curtly. Very well. The guild embraces all capable of hitting their mark, regardless of the weapon. However, be warned, this test is not merely about hitting a target. You will be judged on accuracy, adaptability, and precision. Do you understand? We do, Henry replied. Good. He then turned to the group as a whole. I will be testing your performance individually beginning with our foreigners here. Your test begins shortly. Prepare to prove your worth as marksmen of the Adventurer's Guild.